and welcome to the Zapians Podcast. I'm your host, Lloyd Waits. Today, I'm interviewing Professor Joe Paradiso from the MIT Media Lab. There, he leads the Responsive Environments Group that helps people interact with technology in new and interesting ways. Joe has this knack for being able to take interesting ideas that seem like fantasy and then using technology to turn them into a reality. This is a a bit of a special interview for me because so much of Joe's early career is a lot like mine. We both grew up in Massachusetts. We both went on to work at Draper Laboratory as full-time staff members. And then we both went on to be in the same division at MIT to do our PhD, both doing high energy physics. Not only that, but so much of our lives, we got this passion from science fiction and from just tinkering with electronics that we can see around the house or, or that you can find in, in old junk piles. Um, and I hope for the rest of my career that I live a life that's half as interesting as Joe's. So I really hope you enjoy his story. Thank you. So thanks for, for coming on and taking time to talk with us today. Um, and uh, would you be able to tell us just kind of in summary uh, a basis of some of the projects you do at Media Lab. I know there are a bunch of different projects that you're working on and leading at Media Lab, um, but if you could do like a brief summary of kind of like an overarching idea and connecting sure. them. Sure. Well, mm-hmm. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you guys. Always fun to interact with the Zapians group. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Media Lab has been a long trajectory. I got here in 1994, so I'm doing a ton of projects that have evolved over the decades. We started out doing kind of new sensors for human computer, computer interaction, new ways of of, of getting information into computers for different kinds of user interfaces and different kinds of interaction models. Um, back then, you know, we used to talk about keyboard and mouse or the way you do this kind of a thing, and now you know, there's so many other ways. And mm-hmm. yeah, the world was just starting to get it, and now the world gets it. Uh, there are lots of ways to interact with, mach- with machines. But the Media Lab uh, was founded on a lot of those principles way back when. And uh, my, uh, I, I came in really to kind of expand on those and really build lots of new interaction modalities. But that evolved into wireless sensor networks. Uh, so it was still interaction, but through wireless sensing everywhere, which kind of became Internet of Things. We used to call it ubiquitous computing and pervasive computing back then. We kind of still do. Um, and then we started thinking more broadly about what happens after you have this infrastructure sensing everywhere. And that's a little bit where we are now. Um, So uh, what does it think to be somewhere when you're in this environment with sensors everywhere, right? Can you channel your perception through these sensors in ways that really change your feeling of the here and now? Now they're all isolated via COVID, plugging in via video. We can see a need for this or an evolution in it. Uh, It's got a long ways to go. We poked at the edge of that for a long time with projects like Doppelab and Doppelmarsh, Mm -hmm. where we... uh, manifested sensor data in different ways in the virtual world using artistic uh, uh, interpretations of it and musical interpretations of it. So it was a rich environment that really had lots of conduits from the physical world into the virtual world. You weren't constrained by laws of physics. You could really play with, with, with warping space, with bringing things together, with pulling them apart, with zooming in. And uh, we uh, built a lot of environments about that. We put sensing all over a restore cranberry bog in Plymouth and Tidmarsh. So we did a lot of environmental sensor work, a lot of work with low power sensors, but more importantly, how does that present uh, in a totally different way through different media such as virtual worlds? So we, we that was an arc that went on for years. Still, we're, we're doing quite a bit in there. We've got a dozen projects that live within that infrastructure. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, what we call mediated atmospheres as well lately, which is uh, having environments transform according to how you react to them. So, uh, you know, your office becomes a multimedia environment, so you're having bigger and bigger screens. Um, We have uh, audio, we have lots of things, but these environments now can sense and react to you. So make them transform to bring you again to different places to make you restored and focused, or maybe to make you more creative. So the environment is a partner to what you want to do. Uh, That's moved off into space application now too. since we house the space initiative in my group with Ariel Eklaw uh, being one of my students and uh, we started a few space projects in the group. I've, I've long had an affinity with, with work in space and spacecraft. Uh, it's a different era now for that kind of a thing too. So we uh, you know, looked at, uh, are looking at extensions for astronauts, right? Or people living in a habitat somewhere where you're really constrained because you're inside of a gas, uh, gas-filled can basically. <laughs> 
uh, so you can't go outside, but can you bring yourself virtually somewhere else? Kind of a holodeck, if you want to call it that, right? Um, so we, we think of extensions of that sort. We've got a few spacecraft projects now. We've got uh, uh, Sensei Fabric that we're doing. We have a few pieces of work now in the group on Sensei Textiles. They were very big at the Media Lab in the late 90s when that work started, and uh, they never quite left, but they're coming back into my group and Hiroshi's group, a couple of groups here. Um, and uh, one of the projects is to make a Sensei lining for spacecraft. Uh, so we can start weaving in piezo fibers into the beta cloth that's used as a protective covering. So we can start to characterize and track micrometeorite impacts. You look for damage, but you can also get some idea of maybe what it, what it is. These microfibers on the outside of the spacecraft? Yeah, or? actually we're flying a sample now on the space station. It's a passive sample oh, in the wow. Japanese module. It's a collaboration with JAXA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency. And we're doing another one. We got a grant from the Space Station National Lab to fly an active sample uh, there at the end of the year. So Juliana Churston, who's the student who's, who's driving this whole project, uh, is flat out getting ready for flight. Uh, we still have to characterize some of the samples that she's testing, but she's also getting the flight harbor uh, finalized. It's in good shape, but you know, there's always more to do. Uh, but yeah, that'll be going up uh, around January, I think. How do you make sure a, a fabric survives an environment like that. I mean, when I when I picture a, a towel falling through the atmosphere, it's not a very well, pleasant image for the towel. It's not. It's not really falling. There's no atmosphere, but there is. You know, as you know, atmospheric oxygen is going pretty fast, and that can be nasty. And the space, uh, the fabrics that coat spacecraft, like beta cloth and so on, are characterized to survive that. Uh, that's one of the things we're doing. We, we go into environmental chambers, we look at temperature, pressure, stuff like that. We've been flying a sample now for oh, at least six months. We just had a video session with JAXA uh, recently, and we took a look at it. Still looks okay, uh, although there was a section that's discolored, and we think that may be where you know somebody touched it, right? So skin oils. Mm. Uh, so the weirdest things happen to uh, <laughs> to stuff, you know, based on interactions that aren't necessarily scripted, and that may be one. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see how well it holds up. Hopefully, it does. Uh, piezo material has been flown in space many times now. We can get material that doesn't debole that is somewhat stable. Um, so hopefully the copolymers we're using and the uh, PZT fibers. One of the fibers we're flying is a collaboration with the old Finks lab here at MIT, where uh, that's a group that's expert in making fibers to do all kinds of really interesting uh, things. And they make a really interesting piezo fiber. So we're flying that as one of the samples too. Yo's all excited about seeing what, what comes back from, uh, from the space station. That's, that's really interesting stuff. And another thing I, I want to ask is because you're talking a lot about the Internet of Things and how you're yeah. doing um, kind of integrating more sensory information into working with these different uh, interfaces. Um, and so do you focus on this being something that's a productivity tool? Why do you think this is important? I mean, obviously on the space station, but in kind of a day-to-day -day That's a great. That's people. a great question. Um, oftentimes I don't really think of a real application for what I'm doing. Sometimes we do, right? So we have some projects that are in smart buildings, uh, controlling lighting. Uh, we've done a lot of work in lighting control, actually context control lighting to see, because light switches are obsolete, the building itself will figure out um, uh, what kind of lighting to, to make. And there'll be simple overrides for it. Because you can control, it's like planes. There are too many degrees of freedom to control it all from a wheel to some extent. You need a complicated transfer function in the loop. And for your home, it's getting to be that way too. Too many actuators, you know, lighting is a good example, uh, and it's going to get offloaded onto uh, uh, cloud-based services and other services that run contextual uh, algorithms. So uh, yeah, we do that. We also do work to try to maximize comfort in HVAC. That's work that's ramping up again. We did a lot of it before, a decade ago. We're doing more now to save energy, but uh, trying to infer comfort and maximize comfort. Um, but the Tibmarsh work we did just because we thought it was fascinating. I didn't, well, we can talk about applications. The digital twin is now kind of what we did already in the mid 2000s. And it's Doppel Lab, Doppel Marsh. We had student sensors all over the lab driving the virtual model of the media lab. So you could visit it anywhere, see the lab from the point of view of the data in different ways. Um, but I wasn't think I, I would say that because we have member companies, we have to always think about an application and it's always good to get grounded. It's the beauty of having member companies here. You can't float off in a balloon too far. I mean, you've got to have some rational that, that, that rationale for your work that, that people can relate to. But you know, I did it because I thought, what is this going to be like? 
I mean, <laughs> this is the world is changing. Let's make a piece of it and, and just see what it's like. And that drives me in most of what I do, actually. Yeah, there's always some story about an application. But where will this get us? What is this going to do? What is it going to feel like? So let's build a piece off of it. So I think in the end of the day, that, that drives uh, probably a lot of our mindset. You know, we, we, of course, we will always have some story about why it's important. That's, that's crucial. You need that. But yeah, you need that fascination. Like in science, what, what, what is going on here? You know, what is this really going to be like? Let's try to push it here and just see where, where, you know, what the world looks like from this viewpoint. I think it's it's really interesting that you, you say that because um, we'll get into it in a minute, but uh, you started out in particle physics. It's a completely separate approach to these types of problems, whereas with this, you're taking modern technology and you're seeing how far you can take it and what kind of interesting applications you can do it. You started out doing um, very fundamental research in uh, finding fundamental particles um, and doing very kind of in the weeds work, technical work, doing uh, finite fundamental work at MIT. Um, so I guess kind of to give everyone more of a background, uh, would you be able to kind of give a layout of what your trajectory has oh, been? Oh, sure. It's uh, it's amazing how long it feels now when looking back at what just happens naturally when you get older, right? Your life is a book and there's still chapters to write, but you have that feeling of a book. Uh, not that I would write it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was always a kid. I grew up here in Somerville, actually. And we moved to Medford when I was uh, a teenager. Um, but I was a child of the military industrial complex. So this is in the sixties, really early seventies and sixties. Um, my dad, uh, worked for MIT at first. He's a photographer, actually a photographer, movie maker, uh, videographer. He's kind of a combination of all that started out as a photographer, of course, and then moved into film video later with, uh, the group at, at MITRE that started doing it. So he, he started it at, at MIT RLE, uh, after he had his own studio for a while, he, he did that. Uh, then I came along when I was born, he was at MIT, and then he moved to Lincoln Lab when Lincoln started. So they had a, a photo group there, they wanted him to come out, so he was there. And then he moved to MITRE, uh, and MITRE had a, a film, a, a whole film group. So he was doing that, doing documentary films for basically uh, DOD type projects that MITRE was anchored in, and then, you know, did a lot of videography and photography. So he would work with engineers all the time. And he'd tell me stories about the project. He was very much into technology and science. And that was the period when, you know, we were launching to the moon. There was the space race. Uh, it was in the air. And I had a ringside seat because my dad would, would tell me these stories. He'd bring me home pictures. And we'd see his, his films he was shooting of these projects. I'd meet the engineers. He'd bring me the work. And even better, they would give me components and, and parts. So uh, I loved electronics. My dad would always build things. I learned from him. And... Uh, and then I'd start uh, building things myself and kind of learning from doing. And he'd, he'd just bring me home pretty much what I need because, you know, they had all this surplus stuff there. Mm -hmm. The technicians and engineers were delighted to just send stuff home with, with my dad for me. So, uh, yeah, I was a child of that. And that was kind of crucial in making me a technically focused kid. Uh, at the same time, if you, and I thought about it a lot as a kid, what did I want to be? I wanted to be a fireman when I was really little, but then of course <laughs> it changed. I wanted to be a physicist pretty much after that because physics is such a wonderful field. It's, it's the mother of all the sciences in principle, even though everything gets more complicated still in physics is an element of reductionism where you see fundamental frameworks and theories coming out that can apply across the board. Uh, and when I was a kid, it was obvious, this is what you want to be in if you want to be able to understand all the sciences, because I, I like them all. Um, and physics had a real fascination for me. So that was it. And uh, when I went to Tufts, I was kind of convinced to be an engineer because there might be more uh, uh, application for career <laughs> if you're an engineer. But no, I double majored in physics too. I did astrophysics research with Ken Lang back then. And, and I, 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 I plugged in very heavily to the physics department there. It was a small department, but it is a good department. Um, and of course, the engineering is crucial because it gives you the vocabulary you need for at least for experimental physics. And when I went to MIT and worked for Sam Ting, I, I you know, that I got accepted as the Compton Fellow here at MIT my year. Um, it's one of the big uh, departmental fellowships. Um, I, uh, uh, all the engineering background I have is invaluable. It really stood me out in, in Sam's group. I worked at Draper Lab also as an undergrad uh, when I was at Tufts. And uh, I learned systems programming when I was there, and that was invaluable too. When I'm doing physics, here I am, an expert programmer. <laughs> I can <laughs> I can do things that really the other students couldn't quite do because I had all that background. I knew hardware too, and in Sam's group, it was invaluable uh, to to know all of that. 
And then a side story is that when I started as a grad student, uh, it discovered a big lump in my neck. Um, so I had thyroid cancer and it was, you know, <laughs> spread to the lymph nodes. They were alarmed. Uh, fortunately, I had great care. You know, I had, you know, the surgery I needed. I, I actually had radioactive iodine as therapy. Uh, my, my, this is my first year of graduate student studies. Uh, and I brought a, a Geiger counter with me. It's incredible. They bring this canister in. They take the lid off, and the Geiger counter on the least sensitive scale across the room floors. And they say, drink this. <laughs> it's, a beta, it's a beta source. I-131 doesn't last very long. It's yeah. what gives people thyroid cancer from nuclear fallout and tests. But if you take a lot of it, it'll just kill the thyroid, ideally not do anything else. In my case, it worked. But it turns out the guy that developed that therapy is Carl Taylor Compton, the guy who uh, oh, fellowship. I found out many years later. So he saved my life probably as well as paid my education at MIT. He's one of MIT's icons. He was an incredible guy, really one of the people that brought MIT through uh, World War II and beyond. Um, but uh, anyway, Sam's group was uh, outstanding. I had one of the best times you can imagine, right? Sam, when I first came here, I, I got the fellowship, so all the professors called me up in high-energy physics, and, and I talked to all of them. I didn't get a call from Sam's guys, though. He had just won the Nobel Prize, actually, yeah. just months before. But Vera Kistikowski, when I went to visit Erwin Pless, I mean, Erwin had a wonderful group doing bubble chamber work uh, analyzing with their PDP-10 over at Tech Square. And Vera Kistikowski is one of the professors in the group. I was leaving, she said, did you talk to Sam's people? And I said, well, no, they haven't called me. She said, you definitely should. Uh, talk to Ulrich Becker. So uh, I gave uh, Becker a call uh, from Draper, actually, from my, my lab at Draper. And he, uh, you know, in his, his wonderful, heartwarming German accent, I uh, said, come over. <laughs> sure. And, you know, Ulrich, oh, yeah, I walked in. This is a group that's building stuff. I mean, they were getting ready for the Mark J experiment to Daisy at that time. So they're building these huge drift chambers there. That was Becker's pride and joy at the time. He went on to do great things for L3 and really advanced the state of drift chambers. He's one of the central people in the development of drift chambers. Uh, but he's a, a very unassuming man. But uh, he's got that kind of boisterous attitude. And he's not easy either. Uh, you know Ulrich. He, uh, uh, when I came, he's the only one that was asking me questions. Like, what would happen if I had a bunch of neutrons on the table? And I really didn't know. I thought, well, neutron stars, they're stable. Of course, I didn't think about beta decay at that time. Um, but, you know, I was nudged by these guys. They were building stuff. Uh, and then I was nudged into Ting's office. And they told me, we don't have a lot of time for graduate students, really. We don't take too many. You've got to be good. And uh, you can get your PhD in three years because we don't mess around. And... Uh, and then uh, Sam said, would you mind living in Europe? And uh, well, that <laughs> sounded great to me. Of course, I was a bit intimidated because I was just a kid from Tufts. So granted, I knew some great physicists there. But this is Sam Ting, who just won the Nobel Prize. This is one of the main groups in uh, the US during high energy physics. Um, but man, I, I, it was obvious to me, I'm going to join Sam. Even though people warn me at Tufts, you work 20 hours a day, seven days a week. Ting's guys are pushed. Uh, I discovered it's true. They are. They do. But that's just the culture. That's what you do because you're there to do this stuff. You're going to give it your all. Uh, yeah, and Sam is kind of doing his thing to keep the group on edge. But, uh, yeah, you work hard because you want to work hard. Um, and, yeah, I had time. I took weekends. I'd go into the mountains when I was at CERN. Even at Daisy, uh, I, would, I would take some time and, uh, and go into the city in Humber. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I just – dedicate myself to the job, but I loved it because that's what the culture of what we were. And it was a great group that, that we all helped each other. We all got along. Uh, it was a fantastic time. I mean, Sam did his own thing, but uh, he had just a great group behind him. I think, uh, you know, and, and he really pushed the group to, to do great work. I mean, it's just incredible the stuff that Sam's group did. So uh, it was it was a fantastic experience. And then, of course, I, I, I postdoc with them because I, I went to CERN, did my PhD at CERN, actually, because we had an experiment at CERN that was starting to wind down. Um, Sam brought almost everybody up to DAISY to work on the new experiment. That experiment it, it wasn't getting the resolution they had hoped for. Uh, they didn't see any real breakthrough physics. We could have seen the Upsilon, maybe, if you have more statistics or more resolution, but Letterman beat us to that one. Uh, but, uh, yeah, someone had to finish it to do the continuing physics, to do the... Uh, structure functions and, and all of this stuff. So, uh, and scaling, and, and I did all of that. Uh, but that was great, because there was no one there. You do a high energy physics experiment, even back then, right now thousands of people. 
back then we had maybe 100 people, right? Um, a bit more. But they were all pulled up to Daisy. So I was with the postdocs, embedded with them, doing the analysis and keeping the detector moving. So I knew quite a bit about it. Uh, I learned quite a bit about it. But uh, at the end, it was only me. They all left. And at that point, I was panicked. Can I really do this? Uh, everyone's gone. i got to figure out how to run this analysis package, get the new data through. But, you know, it's like archaeology. You, 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 have, you know a little bit. You see stuff in these files. And, oh, this will work, this will work, this will work. And then the engine starts to turn. And uh, it, uh, it worked. And, uh, you know, being <laughs> the sole person on a big high-energy physics experiment, was a was a, a good experience in the end. I, mean, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, but um, you know, it was was part of I guess my formative years. Uh, and again, as you know, we've unfortunately lost Ulrich the last yeah. year. Uh, he was a lifelong friend. This is what I I'm, I'm actually on the MIT's committee for advising, and uh, I, uh, I I I talked to new faculty. I've been talking to new faculty later this week about the advising relationship, uh, and I learned really a lot of that from Ulrich because. Uh, he wasn't easy, uh, and he was under tremendous stress because Sam had him in every experiment, and Ulrich was just traveling the world between you know, Isabel at that time at Brookhaven, Daisy with experiments running at CERN with uh, the skeleton crew that was there. Mm -hmm. But he didn't let anybody down. Ulrich really you know, kept it all moving, and uh, the times I spent with Ulrich, just going out with him in Geneva, going into the mountains with him, or uh, going out for a meal, and just telling stories, special. And you know, we kept the friendship afterwards. So Ulrich's really been a friend. I've seen him. I've spent time at CERN since when I went back for L3P. Uh, but also, I visited him in Lexington at his house. And he come visit me. He come here to the lab quite often to hang out with the students and, and see us. So, uh, yeah, he was an inspiration. And that's why I tell the students is that your advisor, if it's going to work, is going to become you know, a friend, right? Is going to become, you're part of his family or her family, right? And uh, that's something that will continue past graduation uh, in different ways. So, uh, yeah, that's my model. And uh, it, was, it was a good model to have. So, yeah, Sam's group was, uh, was great. So I went to postdoc at ETH in Zurich after, because after, it's such a great time in Switzerland and CERN. ETH is a little bit different, more conservative. Uh, we were part of the L3 experiment when it was starting. We are developing the central tracker. Uh, I worked a lot with Heinrich Valenta, one of the inventors of the uh, drift chamber, actually. Um, and he was a brilliant guy, young physicist at that time in his mid-30s, but uh, very creative. And I'd hang out with Heinrich. He'd have all kinds of ideas. It was just so wonderful. Um, the ETH team was, was a solid team, too, but they were very conservative, right, at that time. You know, ETH was known as being conservative. Our group leader was a maverick. He was just, Hans Hofer was just such a driven guy. And he, we had infinite resources, so we, uh, funding was not a problem. ETH, that tends to be the story, but with, with Hans, we had all the money we really needed to do what we had to do. Um, but yeah, the group was, was conservative, and I was the radical kind of MIT guy. So I played that <laughs> role, which is not so unusual at ETH, especially back then. Uh, and again, they became great friends, too. Even though I have my two years at ETH, I did a lot of great work. I built my synthesizer there, so uh, I was always interested in electronic music. And kind of at ETH, I built out most of it, even though I started as an undergrad. Uh, and because I, it took a while to develop a social life. I'm an MIT workaholic, and Zurich tends to be a little bit of an uptight place. How do you break in? Eventually, I did after two years. But uh, you know, I would spend all my time in the lab doing work on my project, building my prototype drift chambers. and electronics for the experiment, but then building synthesizer gear too. So I did, I, and I saw a lot of great concerts when I was in Zurich. So it was a great time, but it was also in many ways a stressful time as I was trying to figure out really what I wanted to do and, and where this was all going to go. I've been back to, they called me back twice to ETH actually to work with the team for L3P. Uh, that was the LHC uh, upgrade to L3 we were proposing to do. Never got accepted. I had two great stints at CERN for two months each many years later. And uh, they, they stay good friends. We lost Hans a long time ago. And that group has, has evolved tremendously. It's a very different group now. But uh, yeah, that was also an important period. I didn't recognize it at the time. That's the thing, you're in the midst of this. I knew CERN was important. ETH, I thought, oh, I'm just going through this. It's not going to be important. It was crucial. Now when I look back at the experience I had there, uh, the stuff I did, uh, the stuff I learned, it, it was, was a very important period. Um, and now, uh, you know, ETH called me back to talk about my days at, at ETH and uh, developing a synthesizer when I was there, all that stuff. Uh, they do a thing at the, the 
uh, World Economic Forum. And uh, I met the president and hung out with him. And everybody loved my story of, of my period at ETH. So you never expect things come around the way they do, but they did. And uh, yeah, the period in Zurich was, was a crucial one for me in, in many ways, too. And then I went to Draper um, when I went back. And that was a big decision because I, I had faculty offers uh, that were decent, um, especially one at Carnegie Mellon was a good offer. And, and, and Tings Group really wanted me to do that. They wanted me to continue in physics. And I'd still be collaborating with L3. Uh, and I, I, I liked the group there. They said I could work with the Robotics Institute, which was just starting. So it would have been a whole universe, a different universe where I would have gone there. Um, and uh, I looked back at that choice for a long time. And now, of course, things worked out very well. And, you know, it's not as big a deal. But there's a universe where I did go to Carnegie Mellon, where I did stay in high energy physics. Um, and uh, yeah, I decided, though, no, to go to Draper for a few reasons. One is that I, I miss Boston. I've been in, in Europe for four years. So I figured when I come back to the US, uh, Pittsburgh was a little bit too remote. Boston, I was still very plugged in. Draper also gave me an offer to work with the. Uh, the group that did Apollo. As you know, Draper did Apollo. It, it was one of its real claim to fame was the navigation system for Apollo. Uh, they still had a very active NASA group and uh, was doing all shuttle work at that time, uh, being to do space station work. So they, they, they basically gave me the offer to change fields. I was a high energy physicist. And when I was there as an undergrad, I, I worked on the MX missile and I knew a little bit about what a common filter was, but, but you know, not a whole lot about controls. Uh, but, you know, Draper took the lead. They said, Joe, you can come to work with the NASA group and we give you this offer. We're going to support you in R&D for a year or two, whatever it is. Uh, and we'll come up with projects with you and you can, you know, learn spacecraft control. <laughs> and I went and I did it. So, uh, yeah, that I never thought that would be as important. After I left, after Draper, I did that for four or five years. I saw at that point, uh, I applied as an astronaut. That, what started that actually is going from Geneva to Lausanne after I visited some friends in Geneva at CERN. I was coming back to go back to Zurich, uh, go back to work at Zurich. I was looking at the Herald Tribune, little ad in the bottom, NASA wants scientists, astronauts. Like, oh, that's what I'll try to do. Uh, and of course, you know, the probability of that is never high, although Draper and MIT has placed some, some great people. Um, and uh, I had thyroid cancer, which was in the end, that was just a non-starter. But I didn't care. This is a direction. If I go in this direction, it's going to lead to somewhere different, right? If I go into hydrogen physics, that's going to be its whole path. I kind of did it for a bit. The experiments are getting big. The, the, everything's getting pushed way out. Whereas if I go to Draper and, and, and do spacecraft, it's going to lead somewhere interesting, I think. So I did it. And, of course, then Challenger happened. And, and NASA's, especially GSC, is very conservative. It was extremely conservative then for good reason. I mean, men spacecraft, you don't want to lose people, especially when you start losing people. It's, it, it's, it's very bad, and, and the culture uh, uh, reacts to it in its own way. Um, so I went after four or five years that I learned spacecraft control. I'd done a bunch of, you know, the equivalent of, of DCs actually and over there on, on, on control moment gyros, attitude control for, for, for spacecraft, space station. I developed all kinds of new algorithms to do it, published quite a bit. It was productive. But uh, they started a sensor group. And they invited me to join the sensor group. And I figured, oh, hey, this is kind of fun. I went to work with Jim Hubbard, who was kind of a maverick at Draper. He used to be a professor at Air Astro, but got tired of MIT, and Draper gave him a great offer. He just went across. He's still a good friend. Jim is one of these larger-than-life characters. He's in the National Academy of Engineering, now famous for deformable uh, structures. He's actually doing a lot of that work then with PSO polymers on, on spacecraft and aircraft. Um, but yeah, I jumped over to there. I learned about underwater sonar and stuff like that. And, I started doing actually high energy physics a little bit on the side because L3P started. They called me back to CERN for that. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that went on. But Draper was evolving quite a bit. And, and that was an uncomfortable period for Draper because, you know, when I joined Draper, it was at its peak. They were deep into the Trident program. Uh, the NASA work was, was solid. And, uh, you know, Draper was up to about 2,400 people. Um, by the time I left, it was down to, I think, 1,200, maybe 1,400. And then a couple of years later, it was down to like eight or 900. So when you have a dive like that, uh, morale suffers. And uh, you could feel it. You could feel it. So at that time, most of us were, were saying, OK, this is we, – we, and I did a lot of great work there. I, they gave me a chance to learn all this stuff. I worked with some amazing people. I learned a ton. Um, but uh, OK, what's my next step going to be? 
And uh, I could have gone back to CERN probably. I was in touch still with the groups because I was in charge of alignment at one of the big SSC detectors while I was a Draper. Uh, SSC went down. Uh, but they gave me an offer here at the Media Lab uh, to uh, come for six months. Or was it? Come for, no, it's come for a year. Come for a year. Uh, and it had cut in pay. And I thought, well, this is the wild horse. Should I do this? It doesn't make any sense because it's one year and you get a cut and pay. I'm already in my mid thirties. I realized if I don't do this, I'm always going to look back like the Carnegie Mellon thing. I, that was a, another path. Uh, it was kind of an anointed path. I, I went and did my own thing. And now if I come to, uh, come to uh, the media lab for this one year, you know, who knows if it's going to work, but what the heck, I'm always going to wonder the rest of my life if I don't do this. So I did it and it led to a six month extension. And then it led to a research job, and then it led to a faculty position. So I was able to follow that. I basically, when I came here, I went native, right? Because I, I was always working with media. My dad was into you know film, video, all that. So I spoke that language pretty well. And I've always been doing electronic music as well and building electronic music equipment. So I spoke that language very well. That was kind of my entree here. Uh, and I knew sensors and all this stuff well and the physics behind it. So you know, I started you know, building all these new sensor projects that, that found application everywhere in the lab and I started building applications myself for them. I built a team in the process and then I was able to follow that up. Doesn't always happen, but it really worked out well here. Um, and uh, yeah, I've never looked back. That was, you know, uh, this is such a special place. It's, it's had its ups and downs during my long time here, but man, it just comes back strong every time. There's such a creative energy at the Media Lab. Um, you know, the, the founders of the lab, Nick Raponti and, and Wiesner, really put together an environment where, you know, anything is possible. Um, and no idea is too, too, too large in a way, right? Um, think out of the box. It's kind of what we're built on here. And you, you don't have to propose an idea, go through all these levels of, of, of criticism and approval. You just do it. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, as I said, right, we did these things. I didn't know what it was going to happen, what it was going to become. But heck, this is really interesting. Let's just try it. Academia has more of that freedom. This place really has it, the way it's structured with this funding from the sponsors uh, and the members. And then you're working with the member companies, it grounds you in a great way. So uh, you uh, uh, you can't just totally float off. You know, you, you, you're basically rooted to a reality here of companies that have to make a living and, and build businesses. Uh, and of course, the students we have all over MIT, they're great. Media Lab, we're, they're a special breed. They have this extra creativity. So it's... Uh, it's just wonderful to work with all of them. Anyway, that's a long story, but I told you all of it pretty much. There's always something else, but you have the, the gist. Yeah, you gave me a, a lot to, to talk about. I, uh, I have, I've had one interaction with Sam Ting that I think you might think is kind of funny. So I remember when I was preparing for my oral exam, I was given the JSI particle, yep. which is, of course, what yep. Sam Ting won his Nobel he, Prize yep. for. Um, and so I, I, was wondering, I was doing research on, you know what, I'll just I'll email Sam Ting and see uh what what he has to say no one's on the yep. oral exam committee is going to refute me saying this is what sam ting told me so um i emailed him and then he emailed me right back and i ended up getting a uh, like a two-hour slideshow of everything of, that went into the jsi experiment and it was it was really nice that he was uh i was very appreciative of, of so the thing that. about sam is that he loves to interact with students and he loves to give advice of all sorts i mean i remember sam telling me things he's, he's in lunch with we used to have a lot of meals at Daisy. So you'd get a bunch of people together and he'd invite the students to. And then we'd go off to a Chinese restaurant. My first experience with Chinese food, is, I was always afraid to eat it. I was very picky as a kid. Sam said, here, have some of this. <laughs> <It was party laughs> stuff. And you just, oh, it's actually good. Um, and uh, I remember he used to give me advice. And some of it really sticks. Like, I remember one thing. There's only one thing wrong, well, one thing worse than publishing a wrong result it's publishing verifying somebody else's wrong result <laughs> so these little tidbits of this like this that sam just instilled you remember them mm -hmm. uh i actually hung out with sam in uh, cern just a few years ago uh, i went there to uh to visit sam and the group and it's amazing a lot of the people i work with is still there you know sam his team is very loyal to him because you know it, it's a tough road but he'll go to bat for you they go to bat for him and uh, they stay, they've stayed with Sam, so Joe Berger and uh, lots of the people I, I remember from L3, even before from Daisy, 
we're still with Sam. Joe goes back to Brookhaven, if, if not before. Um, but uh, Sam would always really care for the students and would, would talk to them. So, uh, yeah, if you show interest in his work, you know, Sam would, would blossom as an MIT student. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. No. And that, that uh, MIT culture that you mentioned of long work days, that's definitely still true. And I think a lot of it is just because I was, well, I mean, here I am not doing my thesis work and I'm doing podcasts, doing interviews with, with people outside of my field. Or, I mean, sometimes a lot of the time I'm just kind of, I, I look up how to do image swaps on neural networks because I yeah. think it's just a, a cool application yeah. of technology that yeah. I want to do. Uh, there's so many opportunities to do things anything. Actually, when I was, even at Daisy, right? I work all the time, but I have to do something artistic to have fun. So I remember I made a graphics program on the storage scope that we had that would just, you know, have the, all these these dots that would ping pong off the sides and change velocities and stuff. It was all just fun to look at. And the technicians loved it and they spread it all over Daisy and people were running this kind of a screensaver. Um, but uh, in at CERN, I, I did, I did, of course, I built a little KMAC synthesizer and I used to do music with it and other things. So it's important to do that. But yeah, somehow we find the time for this extra stuff that's always, you know, pushing us in different directions. But then the work that we do is, 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 there's no end to it, but it's wonderful, right? Because you're able to, to do the stuff that, uh, that really is at the edge and work with great people. And uh, yeah, we, we have that ethic at MIT. I think the thing that I've experienced the most is that the best resource is the people that are here because I can always just I can send a text message to a friend of mine who knows more about writing Python and about some yeah. silly problem that I have where otherwise I'd be scrolling through Stack Overflow for hours. And I think it's odd now the way that that expands to the world. So when I was a Draper, it's a great example. Um, you know, in Tink's group, Tink's group is small, so uh, but I could go around Daisy or around CERN. And I find all kinds of great people that could, could really weigh in on any question I have. Um, and you have to physically go meet them. <laughs> Back, there's no, you, we didn't have email actually either. So it's word of mouth and then you call them and make an appointment. Um, but uh, Draper was great that way because you had people who had been around for a long time and they're really good engineers. So uh, I would hear that, you know, Brock Du knows all about this system or this other guy knows all about heuristic search or something like that. And these are all you know, people that, you know, Brock, for instance, did radiation hardened CCDs. And I was actually interested in putting an imager into a uh, uh, detector for alignment. So radiation hardening of imagers was of some interest to me at that time for physics. Mm -hmm. But he had done it for missiles, <laughs> for the Trident. <laughs> right. And uh, that was one example. He also did a lot of work with uh, programming on the, uh, the Z8, which is a processor I, I, I used quite a bit back then. Um, but yeah, these are just people and you talk to other people, they know this person, that person, talk to this person and you get good on a chain. You find someone who really knows all this great stuff. I remember, uh, uh, Ulrich told me that they had some issue with the drift chamber. They need some material. So someone said they should just talk to Doc Edgerton, right? He was still around then. So Ulrich just walked over to Edgerton's office, probably with a student. And Doc says, oh, try some of this. Open the drawer. And he had this material that was a real solution for what they wanted. I forget what it was. Maybe in some resistive element in chamber or something like that. Yeah, so as you know, I, I worked at Draper before I started yep. my PhD and am now at Draper Fellow. We'll probably return there after yep. I, I finish. Um, how do you think Draper has changed over time? I know you mentioned kind of the sh shape of it changing. Um, yeah, Draper has gone through many episodes. Uh, someone should write a history. There probably is a history on Draper written. Actually, Inventing Accuracy is one of the most gripping books I've read in a while. I read it when I left Draper. And uh, I knew a lot of the people in it because I had been involved with strategic systems. And through NASA, I met some of the people too. Um, and that really talks about, you know, Draper's formation and then, you know, the, the main guidance projects that were really spearheading a lot of what, what Draper pulled around. Um, and I remember as an undergraduate, uh, when I was over at DL6 on, on Albany Street back then, um, you, you had the feeling of Draper being involved in many things, and it was exciting, right? So the MX, there were protests outside, because this is you know still MIT's, not really part of MIT at that point, but it's MIT's DOD extension to some extent that's here in Cambridge. Uh, Lincoln Lab has got the advantage of remoteness. Um, but yeah, 
there are people doing all kinds of cool stuff and uh, Draper was expanding still. Trident, of course, was getting very big. I was doing MX at that time, which was, was starting to peak. I mean, to be an undergraduate working on the MX guidance system, and granted, I was doing systems programming for uh, testing calibration, but you know, I, I just learned the lay of the land of these things, which helped a lot because the inertial systems were a big part of what I did afterward for wearables. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I had a security clearance. I was actually working in a lab is an undergrad uh, where we're testing the MX, and that was of course highly classified and have a clearance because Draper fellows at that point usually didn't get. I wasn't even I was an undergrad. I was I wasn't even Draper fellow. I was an undergrad, so you wouldn't get clearances. At one point, they found I didn't have a clearance, and people weren't too happy. I got one pretty quick. So here I was, what I was 19 years old, and <laughs> had a security clearance. That, that felt kind of cool. But yeah, Draper was expanding, so uh, and you could explore, you could do lots of different things within Draper. Uh, there wasn't so much questioning. There always is some of that in any organization, but I didn't feel the bureaucracy at all at that time. I was insulated from it to some extent, but I think there wasn't much of it either because it was, it was still expanding. It's coming off of Skylab. Actually, they're doing Skylab when I was there, so still doing Apollo work, or at least work that came off of Apollo. And then, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it catapulted into shuttle and, and other things. But uh, you had connection with the space work. We knew it was happening. I wasn't in that building, but I knew people that were, were embedded in doing that work. Um, and it just had the feeling of, of lots of possibility. That's one of the reasons why I went back to it, right? Um, Draper got involved with Ting uh, kind of when I was at CERN, when I was a postdoc with L3, because they did the, I did the first work on drift chamber alignment with Ulrich with this little CCD based system we, we developed. Uh, but then Ulrich realized it needs to be integrated with the structure. The structure has to be extremely precise. We don't really have the background. Draper knows about stuff like this. He got Draper involved. And Draper did some, some really good work. Uh, but I remember seeing the Draper engineers when I was at CERN, and I didn't feel, one of the guys asked me, I was thinking about going back to Draper at that point. He said, Joe, why do you do that? You're, you know, you're here. In a way, he's right, because I was native at CERN with the physicist. Mm -hmm. Going to Draper is different. Uh, but yeah, I went and did it anyway. And the NASA stuff was great, although at that time you could sense that it wasn't growing, right? Although it's gone through periods of growth and, it, and it's changed. At that time, really, you know, JSC was having to justify the extra expense of Draper. You know, we weren't like a contractor, although we were special, you know, we were great engineers of Draper, we'd say that, and that was true. Um, but, you know, you could see the signs of contraction. And then, uh, you know, the General Jake, I forget his, uh, Jacobson is his name, came on after, after was it Bob Duffy, I think? Yeah, it was Bob Duffy. Bob was a great president of Draper. Uh, it really expanded. Bob was wonderful. And Draper still had the feeling of Draper. Jake came in. It was different. We, we went to a matrix model. It got compartmentalized more. Um, you had to have 20 signatures on a form to even buy. A, I want to buy these cameras from my work at the SSC, and I had to have all these signatures. You know, went to timesheets before we didn't have them, right? And this is natural part of growth to some extent, but it's also part of contraction. Because at that time, Draper, we weren't getting the work. We lost the strategic missile work. The world had changed. It was still trying to figure out what else it was going to do. There were exciting corners, but you could see that it was coming down. It was different. So the feeling was not a great feeling when I left. And you know, everyone will acknowledge that. It's just one of Draper's more difficult periods. Um, but it, it went through episodes after. Now, I saw it only remotely. Draper came back as sponsors. I remember Ellie Guy came back, brought Draper back, I seem to remember. And he's such a character. I remember and Paul Van Brokhoven, those guys I used to work with. It was great to have them back here at the lab because they, you know, saw the excitement here. They saw all the innovation, the wearable stuff was interesting for them, things like that. So they were here for a few years. So I got to interact with them again. And uh, yeah, I saw Draper was in the midst of, of changing, right? You know, I think Jake had finished his time. They had a different president. A guy from Lincoln, I think, came at one point to run it. And Draper started, you know, building up again. There was excitement again. Draper was hot. And I think that went maybe through its own period. And But now, I mean, they're sponsoring Nova. The new logo looks like the Star Trek emblem. It's just yeah. great. <laughs> uh, they're really interesting going back to the moon, which we are now too. So uh, all the stuff on bio and bio happening at Draper was never happening when I was there. And they're taking their MEMS expertise and, and really projecting it into different places. So uh, yeah, Draper's, Draper's back, I think. And uh, it's, it's a different, different game. 
but uh, yeah, it's it's from what I hear, people like you, <laughs> and some people I know that they're, they're doing various things. I had the Dragonfly guy give a talk in my my class not not long oh, ago. Uh, we had him give a talk at Sapiens as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah uh, Jesse no, Wheeler. Yeah, yeah. No, Draper uh, has that as a really a flagship project is is an example of the the cool stuff it does. But yeah, it still has the capacity to do cool things. It's still are doing cool things. So uh, yeah, and I think it's it's a different game. The space game is open. It's a whole different world now. So I think Draper is, is seeing the set of opportunities it's, it's climbing into that are going to pull it into a great place again. I see evidence of it happening now from what I see. That it's a different generation, right? My, my guys, they're all retired. People I was there with, they're long gone for the most part. So there are new people at Draper. And uh, I think uh, I think it's great. Actually, it's funny. Uh, the guy running this one of the space programs uh, is the son of, of my old roommate when I was there. So oh, really? yeah, Daryl Sargent was my uh, my first office mate at Draper. Him, very good friend, and uh, I learned a lot about space from from Daryl because he was a physicist, an astrophysicist. He decided he wanted to do something else. He went to work at Draper and really played a main role in in the NASA programs. So through Daryl, I, I I learned a ton, uh, and uh, yeah, his son I remember was just a little kid, <laughs> and now he's I think he's running a good part of the space work there now too. So that was just so great to see him uh, continuing on with what his dad had done. Uh, but yeah, my generation has, has done its thing. And, uh, and j will keep some of the old guys on too as, as uh, they come back and they consult. And that's a great thing because they have some real experts, right, in, in some areas there. And, uh, you know, they keep continuation a little bit that way. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole new group running Draper and, and working in Draper. So uh, yeah, I don't recognize most of the names I see. Except, except legacy if it's the son of somebody like like Daryl's son. But uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a great time. And uh, Draper's poised to, to, to push it, especially with this whole new space that we've seen. It's just so exciting. Um, so when you mentioned when you went from Tufts to uh, MIT graduate school, that a lot of the skills you had learned in kind of engineering focus were very helpful and kind of put you at, an, put you at kind of an advantage when you were going into, yeah. into physics. Was there anything that kind of went the other way as well as you transitioned out of physics back into engineering and then into media lab doing very different work? The background you have in physics, mm -hmm. it's one thing, I, math in general is never wasted, doesn't matter what kind of math, but you know, physics is the same thing, right? It's, it's all useful. Um, and actually when I, uh, when I went into physics, I remember seeing through Jeffrey Goldstone's quantum mechanics class. Oh, geez, I couldn't understand a thing he was saying. He, of course, he's, he's known for that. <laughs> but, you know, this is bracket notation. So I, I never really learned. I learned regular Schrodinger wave equation, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly, this is for adults. <laughs> and, of course, after having my, my thyroid run down to zero and two weeks late in MIT classes, it was, it was an epiphany for me. It worked out. But that was another one of life's bottlenecks. Uh, so I had to stretch myself pretty far and I did but then when I went back into control theory all the stuff I was doing quantum mechanics damn it's the same math group theory is there in control theory uh, lead derivatives are there in control theory especially nonlinear controls I knew something about them through you know what I learned in physics mm -hmm. so uh, that was definitely useful um, the thing that was intriguing is after I, I, I did all this spacecraft stuff and did my stuff at Draper I went back to physics for you know, those two month periods in two summers, I developed a calorimeter simulation, a very efficient one, and then started looking at Higgs to gamma gamma and different kinds of Higgs signatures in the electromagnetic calorimeter. That was my, my function when I was there. So I came up from you know being out of the field for a long time, doing some work maybe with alignment. I, I was very interested in triggering, so I plugged a little bit into the triggering group, which is kind of how I got into the calorimeter. Um, I wondered, I mean, look, I've been out of it. Am I going to even understand what they're talking about? I did. And not only that, I caught up. So at the end, my stuff is one of the you know big parts of what they presented at Evian for the proposal. Of course, unfortunately, we didn't get it. But of course, it made a lot of sense for other reasons. Um, but uh, I was there again. And uh, I remember one point I had worked to get the results done before I went back to the US after the two months. I had worked night and day for at least a week, maybe two weeks. At both times I was there cranking this out. The second time when I got those final results coming back, I remember I, I 
drove Lisa Tassapaus was, was leading that team. She's a physicist from ETH, became actually head of the department there, or at least the high energy physics department. Uh, retired now, by the way. Uh, I sat on a panel with her at the World Economic Forum in China many years later. It was just serendipitous, right? You just meet people. Mm -hmm. It was so great to see her again. But uh, I, I went to her apartment to present the results, and she was all excited. We talked about what was going to go on to Evian with the presentation. And then I remember getting back into my little CERN Renault 04 to drive back to CERN. I just started laughing, hysterically laughing in the car in the middle of Geneva. I could barely drive. It, it was a few things. I was exhausted to breaking point. This is the most exhausted I've probably been. Um, and I was elated, you know, because I did it. I was there. So it was relief. It was exhaustion. And it was elation. I came back. So it was just... Uh, an epiphany kind of but what did i do i got i kind of left it and came to the media lab um i, I look at my experience with physics is 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 vertigo the movie the hitchcock movie you've seen it probably i have not oh it's a masterpiece yeah, one I, of the best movies it's, ever it's made. really really good um i, I like hitchcock so yeah hitchcock so he's 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 certainly at the top of his game forever but that was one of his real achievements and in the we this is a bit of a spoiler but he drops the woman off the tower twice right uh, you know, he, first time, then uh, he, he works hard, finds her again, and drops her again. And in a way, for me, it's like, and you love this woman. Physics is the same thing. I love it. Uh, I just, it's one of the most important things you can do. And I really relish the time I spent in it. Uh, but yeah, I went off to do space and other stuff. But then I got it back, and I could have stayed, but <laughs> I dropped it off the tower again. Uh, to do Media Lab and the other things. I don't regret it at all, but uh, it's that kind of a, uh, a relationship. But uh, yeah, the beauty of what I do here at the Media Lab, and it's MIT in general, but especially being here, I still have connections with, with physics. We did this whole project with CERN, sonifying the LHC data in real time. So I, I plug in with them again. Um, uh, you know, we, we, I, I talk with them all the time. We talk about ideas and projects. And at this point, I'm on committees with everybody. It's just what happens. You get old here. But, uh, yeah, I never quite totally left it. Right. So I still have my fingers in a few things. I'm, I'm not a physicist at this point as a practicing high-energy physicist at CERN doing experiments. But I, I can plug in and talk with these people. And, and once in a while, we'll have some crazy project we'll do here that we'll, we'll fit in with it. So it's just wonderful to keep that going at some level so important so if you were giving advice to a high energy physics student uh and they were saying well I, what are kind of the most generally applicable skills that i can develop what would you say are some of the skills oh man it's, there's so many right i mean certainly analysis math software universally applicable scientific computing it's it's use it anywhere you go physics itself look when i teach the sensors class here at the media lab I don't just teach DIY, even though some of the students might prefer that. Um, I show applications, but I really talk about the fundamental physics behind the detector, right? So, you know, the physics itself is important. You're not going to waste it. So getting involved in, in any kind of a detector or any kind of experimental apparatus, I mean, just, just the stuff you're going to learn in physically building this thing, achieving, look at Ulrich, right? Building the precision he was able to do, the lengths you have to go. Uh, it's it's important to, to have an appreciation for that and have knowledge of these things. Uh, working in a team, you're working in a big team. How this team dynamics are crucial because that's how everything is done now. You know, you're not in yourself by yourself. Even here at the media lab, I'm working with teams at various scales. Um, so these are all important. The math critical, right? Never wasted. So you know, you're coming into experimental physics or, or theoretical physics even more. You're gonna you're gonna have an appreciation for that. You're gonna have some background, and it's important to polish that. So yeah, go ahead, do your work, uh, cruise on with all cylinders, but realize that it's not wasted. Just keep accumulating more knowledge and more background and poke into interesting corners. That's what I would do when I was at CERN and all my life, right? Someone's doing some interesting work down the car. Let me talk to this guy and learn what he's doing. Maybe I can do something with, with this, do a collaboration with this person, uh, push it somewhere different. Uh, this is always a great thing. And that will lead to other directions, right? That may lead you out of physics. It may lead you into a different part of physics. It may lead you deeper. But uh, yeah, always keep your eyes open and look for interesting opportunities. That, that's a crucial thing. So uh, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about your uh, your work at the Media Lab. Sure. So um, some of the research projects that you've done, there were a couple that kind of pulled me in a bit. So 
one of the, the ones that I thought was really interesting was a, a kind of auto sculptor where you had a, an actuated motor attached to, I think it was like a Dremel, and it would yep. pull in and out depending on yep. what the actual shape was. Um, and one of the things that you really keyed on um, was talking about how this does not eliminate art because you can still see individual uh, kind of participation even though they're using this kind of automatic sculpting yep. tool. Um, but then the other question I, I was wondering about was it seems to be based on a CAD drawing. So would you say that there's a lot of art that would be going into the 3D model that is mimic being mimicked by this this 3D actuated sculpture? Um, repeat the last question again, the last part. So the I, I would assume that this, this sculpting is being done based on some CAD model. Yeah. It's some, some 3D shape. So do you think a lot of the kind of uh, artistic interpretation would also be going on inside of this CAD model, like what the exact shape of oh, the, I think, the 3D model I think if be. you want to look forward, what, what this project tried to address was a partnership between the world of computation and the human, where it's it's embodied in the hand, right? Mm -hmm. So is, our artisan is great with, with their hand tool. Computer knows about precision. Uh, computer can improvise in ways that the human wouldn't. The human improvises definitely in ways the computer won't. Uh, and they have this dialogue back and forth. So what are some of the ways you can begin to address that? That came from Amit Zoran, uh, who uh, is a really gifted student. He's now a professor at Hebrew University. Um, very media lab in that he's a designer. Uh, something of a musician. He never jammed with us, but he could play guitar. <laughs> That's what, what I would hear. But he developed this thing called the Chameleon Guitar, which is why he came to me. So uh, he was in Patty's group. I was a reader on that. And that was a guitar with a replaceable resonator. So you just, instead of getting the guitar, just slap out the resonator. Um, but then he went to work with Bill, Bill Mitchell to think about, you know, the whole future of fabrication and, and artisanship. And Bill, unfortunately, passed away. So Amit decided to come to me. And he infused that whole area to the group. That's one of the great things about MIT. We have these great students. And I tell this to faculty a lot. I could have bent a meat into doing a sensor network, maybe, uh, or doing a wearable or something. And we actually did some wearable stuff. I, 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 of course, I nudge him. But you don't want to break the student, right? You, you don't want to force the student into a mold. It's not going to fit the student. The student comes in. You think of a way to integrate the student and, and think of interesting places their work can go. Not you got to do this now. So, I mean, if you have a proposal and you're stuck, this is the work you have to do. Maybe you have less options. But here... You know, we can kind of invent the world as we as we go. So me came and, and instead of forcing him into, you know, doing something like a musical interface again or something like that, I uh, let him run with that. But, you know, we played a lot with, uh, you know, well, do you wear something? Do you leave it on the tool? What does the tool do? How do you track it? And what kind of um, algorithm are you going to use to adapt? And that was a big part of you know, kind of what you're talking about here, where if the artisan changes their mind, the computer wants them to do this thing it has in CAD, you change your mind, you start doing something different. How does the computer adapt to that? And uh, one way is going to have very different models and just choose another one that's nearby and try to, you know, go to that. Uh, another one is you can do a spline fit or something like that. So the computer is still, you know, spooling out what the artist does. Uh, but then with the override, that's the whole thing with, with this whole future. Patty used to talk about this and, and Roz too. Um, the world is going to, these agents are going to get their preferences from what you do, not from what you explicitly tell it. Because I have to tell a computer everything. Even now, I mean, I get endless uh, requests for surveys. I don't do them because I just don't have time in my life. Even though some of them are important, I mean, I, I, I just have an allergy to any kind of survey now. Uh, things should be able to figure it out. And if you look at what, you know, Alexa, you know, Google Home and all these things are doing in Nest, they're learning it from your natural actions. And Amit was was there with, with hand tools at that point where, you know, you're not telling the computer explicitly in the cat, I want to do this. You do some of that to set it up, but then you're going, it's going to improvise and react to what you're doing as a partner, right? It has its set of abilities, you have yours, and you're all working together. So he did it a few different ways. Uh, it could have gone a lot further. We, we actually we have a few different problems. We had the airbrush, then we did the... Uh, uh, the ECAD tools that, that Pergun did. He did also a handheld printer. Same kind of idea. There's a model it's working from. You have the judgment, and, and it's a choreography between what you have in your hand and, and what the computer thinks you want to do or want to see. Um, but that's, that's something that's going to continue. Right. So 
I was actually planning on asking about the custom airbrush and the, and yeah. the same models because they are kind of all in the same vein. Um, so where do you kind of define what the art is? Because I know you're saying that you have some influence on it with your hand and then whoever does the 2d rendering or the graphic design of it also has some kind of impact based on what the computer wants to see so where do you say kind of the art is how do you define that's, what the art is that's a bigger question than just this project right right so the whole idea of, uh, of computer leveraged art is it's it's huge right we've done lots of installations even the stuff i do in my synthesizer i don't necessarily have a computer in the loop all the time but there'll be uh uh, a set of rules, and the artist defines the rules. Uh, the artist may define some of the palette, but the computer will explore the space and flesh it out. Uh, you're just basically giving the computer the framework in which it, it's going to move. Uh, I love these things because you don't nail it down. It's great to have, you know, this is a piece of art. This is what it is. On the other hand, this is now dynamic because we can make it dynamic. Um, so I'm not going to say exactly what to show. I'm going to give frameworks, examples, constraints, uh, set gains, whatever else I do, and then let you know the computer in its, in its interaction maybe with the user start to flesh it out, or in this case with the artisan. So I think in, in Amit's case, it's still the artisan in control, I guess, and the, the artisan has set it up with the computer, with the CAD model, has some, gives the computer some idea of what he wants to do or she wants to do. Uh, but then uh, through the interaction with the tool, you can depart from that and the computer will follow your lead, adapt. Will the computer in this case suggest somewhere to go? Uh, I don't think Amit did that in his work. There's so many projects, I, you know, we'd have to look through all of it to see where that boundary was. Uh, but definitely now, it's a huge part of that. I mean, the mediated atmosphere is to some extent that, right? The computer is looking at your mood. It's bringing up some sort of environment based on where it thinks you, where it thinks you want to go uh, and what it thinks you react to the most. So we're going to start to see that quite a bit. Where it's not necessarily the computer responding to doing exactly what you tell it. The computer's going to be responding to a set of constraints and goals and 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 algorithms that are going to nudge it in different ways to nudge you, right? You're being, social media is doing it all the time. But in the art world, you're going to have the same kind of thing you already do. And I, I think this is kind of a, a fundamental question about human nature in a lot of ways too, and because you kind of are deciding, well, how much control do I actually want over this object? So yeah. like, say I want to draw a picture of a dog and I'm a terrible artist and I can't draw a picture of a dog that yeah. doesn't look like a, a I blob. Can't, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> right, so... Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, do I know what I want because I don't know which lines to draw specifically on the dog to make it look like how I envision in my head? And do you think the computer is enabling you to kind of fill in the gaps in your own mind, or do you think the computer is guiding you through? Uh, oh, it's, it's a bit of both. Right yeah. now, I mean, when I want to get an idea, right, if you want to come up with a different kind of a, a image for a dog, right, mm -hmm. uh, or in this case, if I want to build something, uh, I go to a stock room. I see lots of stuff. Same thing, you know, even with, with look, trying to think reconceptualizing a dog, I could look at images of dogs. If the computer can show me them, there are probably examples of that. I can start using a deep net to fill it in. Already Photoshop does that. If I, if I make a mistake, it'll generalize and, and kind of do that. At some point, it's going to yeah, know it's want, I want a dog, and it's going to start to hone in on what it thinks a dog should be. And then based on how I, 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 I either establish a preference or change what I'm doing, it will change the kind of dog it's basing it around. Uh, so it's very fluid, right? At this point, everything is morphable. And how the user interacts, we just have the computer go off and dream, and it does that beautifully, right? The deep dream stuff is fascinating, where you train a network on all these things, it regurgitates it back in fascinating ways. Um, or my synthesizer dreaming of plasma physics, like when I had it at the, uh, at the plasma center, right? I, use plasma data to drive it. I use plasma data for the sounds. I had my own stuff in there. It would never repeat. It got into th some familiar patterns maybe here and there, but it was never the same. It ran for three months. So it, I like to think of it as dreaming, even though it's an analog. I guess it is connections because it's all patched. But it, it basically is just going to the state. I gave it parameters. I sculpted it. I set the boundaries. I set some of the goals or some of the processes. But it just went and did this. And... Uh, I think that's a part of the way people can interact with these digital systems is that we, we, we set it up and we shape it. We can even nudge it a bit, but then it's going to go. We did this thing actually where people would interact with it in real time when it was the MIT Museum. 
We still have one of these autonomous patches, but people could control things. But it wasn't like controlling one knob or it was controlling many parameters with each knob, putting it to very different spaces. So there were people interacting, getting causal interaction. Dozens of people all over the world would interact with it. But it was interpreting it in its own complex way. Even though there was no computer, it was an elaborate state machine that was reacting to what they were doing. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a partnership that is going to evolve a lot. Who is being creative? What is creativity? Uh, right now, again, we can think out of the box in ways computers don't. As we generalize, at least, in ways computers don't. But uh, computers can toss all kinds of ringers our way, can bring us to something we've never seen. Already Google is doing it when they do a search even, right? So uh, this is going to be a partnership with the computer, finding things, bringing things to us, suggesting things to us. And then we're either proving or not approving, or we're saying, no, I want something more like this. It's a partner. And that was kind of happening in the hand at a very rudimentary level with these projects. Uh, it's happening all over the art world in different ways now. Uh, who is the artist? Is my synthesizer the artist for the Plasma Fusion Center? No, but it's me, but people identify me with my thing I built and the patch I put in. So, you know, we're kind of, uh, I guess we share equal credit because if I didn't have that big synthesizer, no one would care maybe as much, but <laughs> seeing this huge thing make the sound, it's more interesting. So part of why I brought this up is so you mentioned kind of neural networks creating these dreams, these very right. fantastic images that um, are also very specific. Every yeah. individual pixel has a value. Yeah. And what I think is kind of interesting is that in humans, if you talk about a human dream, they'll say, oh, I was in this place that had a whole bunch of books. And if you ask the person, well, what was the name of one of the books on that shelf? They won't know. They won't be able to fill in those yeah. individual gaps. So do you think the role of technology in this case as a tool is kind of filling in those individual gaps that these people have in kind of their their natural state. That's a great way to put it. I think uh, technology does fill in gaps. Where uh, The music example, I don't play the notes. Maybe I played some of them in there. But physically what it's coming up with is what it more or less decides to put in, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, I'm saying I want sounds kind of like this and I dial it in, but it's got a big space I can explore inside. So it's filling in the actual detail. And you go into digital realms or neural net realms like you mentioned, right? It, it's learned on particular dogs. Um, you have learned on particular books. I don't know. I haven't seen a bookshelf recreated. You could do it. You could do it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's going to fill in the gaps. And, you know, we're specifying the structure. Uh, I mean, a talented artist, my, my daughter is actually becoming a really good artist now and amazed at what she does. She just did a Totoro picture for Japanese school. And, and there's so much detail in all these little dust sprites and all these other things. And uh, it's great to see, you know, in her mind, all these little things she wanted to add. I can't do that uh, when I draw pictures like a diagram all the time. Um, but yeah, and I see a little bit of music, right? I do it with... My electronic music systems, I definitely, last decades, I, I stepped back with the system and explore. So it'll do the details. Uh, if I were painting, it would be the same thing where it would do the dust sprites and figure out what to put in. Because we can do that now, and these tools are coming out. And I already have Photoshop. I play with rudimentary versions of these things. Um, but there's nothing like playing an instrument. So when I, you know, I love to play keyboard, especially during quarantine, I'm playing a lot more. The students got me back into playing again. I played kind of as a teenager. And, a little bit into my 20s. When Zurich, I played quite a bit, but then I forgot about it. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of dragged me back. I uh, said, Joel, you can play a little keyboard jam with us. It was so wonderful. Good for the group, good for me. And I never quite left it then. And during quarantine, I've got all my keyboards set up. And just playing is so much fun. I'm not a great player. You know, it's, and I can play a psychedelic thing. In certain realms, I can, I can be agile and have fun. And it's just so good to do it all. Right? Yeah, I made some effect or whatever, but I'm, I'm playing the note. Uh, it's different from what I do with the synth. Very different. And I guess it's like an artist. You have this thing. I have a computer do some things. And I can do a great piece of art, and it's actually gratifying in some way. But if I do every little bit, there's something special about that. So, something really engaging. Uh, it's so important to the human process, too, right? It's like exercise. If I play an instrument for a while, it's just a tremendous outlet. I always feel bad, especially if you play with a band. You're training ideas back and forth, and and after two or three hours of a good jam, you just feel great. Uh, so something important about that. You, know, you can't give it all to the computer. You can, and it's okay, and you can do some great art. But there's something special about doing it all yourself, too.
I mean, I want to give that away, mm -hmm. right? You want to definitely keep the ability to focus in to nail down. And computer music performance is one of my big beefs with them. I've gone to many, uh, especially in, you go back 10, 20 years ago, it was hard to see with a new controller, especially what the, the musician was doing. Because the computer would be, the mapping would be so heavy, the computer is so heavily leveraged, you couldn't tell what was doing what. It might be really interesting, but you know, what's the person really playing? Where's the experience of seeing someone push the edge of an instrument? You don't have it. I think even in a computer leveraged performance, having moments when you draw back this digital veil, as I call it, and have the person show virtuosity, really see what they're doing. It's such a motivating thing. I, I think in a way it's more maybe like sports. I, I'm not a sports follower really. I can appreciate what an athlete does. I've worked with the doctors of the Red Sox. Great, great experience doing sensors to, to really ascertain and and uh, evaluate athletes. Um, but uh, okay, people can see a great play and go to a great game. There's a certain feeling. And I've had some of that on occasion. But I go to a concert. I go to them all the time. At least I used to before quarantine. You're seeing some amazing instrumental performance, some amazing feet on, on an instrument, an amazing piece of music with great performance. There's something special about it. And it's because you're seeing people physically push their limits in different ways. And mentally, they're pushing in composition. Physically, they're pushing it. So when we start abstracting this all to computers to some extent, we want to keep some element of that intact. I think a great performance has it. Um, I guess if you're looking at a piece of art, doesn't matter if the artist did every little bit or not. You can argue about that. Uh, but for the artist, it probably does matter <laughs> because there's a certain experience in that, that that we want to keep at some level. So it kind of reminds me of a story that a friend of mine told me who's a chemical engineer, um, and it was that there was a material, or I guess not a material, but uh, a formula to be able to make cake just by yeah. adding water, and then you stick yeah. it in the oven, and then you're done. But no one bought it. And so they modified the formula to make sure that you needed to add some eggs to the batter and then mix it up and then you could yep. make the cake. And then everyone started buying it because it made them feel like yep. they were cooking and yep. being part of the loop. And when I heard that story, I said, that's silly. Like, well, I, I would totally buy the water the water cake yep. that I could stick in the oven. Um, but it does connect to what you're saying with, with instruments and also with a lot of your kind of making sure that humans remain in the loop on a lot of these controllable systems. Yep, yep. So where do you think that, that line is? Where do you think it's really important to make sure that someone is still in the loop? And where do you think it can kind of be offloaded to a machine? I, well, this is at the heart of Zapien's uh, philosophy, I guess, at some <laughs> point. And we've talked a lot about this in the past when right. I've hung out with you guys at events. One thing I, I've said a lot over the last years is uh, our brain is moving outside of our head in some sense, or at least our mind is moving outside of our head. Uh, identity begins to get blurred because we're connected all the time at this level to other people and to other places and things. Um, so who am I? I mean, where am I was the question kind of addressed earlier with uh, presence, right? The whole idea of playing with that. Who am I is the next one. It's crucial now because, you know, with social media and people you know, building these affinity groups that, that cross continents and can hallucinate. Actually, the net hallucinates in many ways, just like people do, because uh, you know, we are connections and infrastructure here. And if we don't have the right inhibitory processes, we're always getting crazy ideas. Uh, we lose track of reality, right? So I can start hallucinating things because my brain isn't shutting them down like it normally does. Um, same thing happens in the net, right? If we don't have inhibitory processes to shut down hallucinations, and that's gonna hallucinate uh, and people come up with QAnon and whatever else. Now, I'm giving a simplistic example right. Right. kind of as a technologist, but it's the same kind of process. Now, uh, some governments will throw Thorazine on the net and shut it all down, like, you, you know, somebody's hallucinating, same kind of a process, right? Uh, there may, hopefully, there's something, because, again, if you shut down a human that way, it may prevent the hallucinations and they won't function, but it's going to be difficult to keep the same creativity. You, you know, you've got to have the right balance. And of course, there are all kinds of other drugs people can use and a skilled psychiatrist can do different things. But, uh, and we're still learning. I mean, we're still in a very early stage of treating these things. But now if you talk about the net as a whole, uh, how do you get to higher levels of creativity? Uh, it's like what Tom Malone used to call uh, uh, collective intelligence. We still use that term here at MIT. I think it's such an important goal because social media, connections between people, getting your brain outside of your head with the internet of things, whatever else, it, it wants that. It wants to get it there. You, you, I know you read some science fiction. I think it was Gregory Benford used to talk about these far future civilizations as great rivers of mind, right? I love that word. 
because it's a whole idea of consciousness just flowing in, 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 in an amorphous way. And uh, how can we get there and not break down from these, these kind of sh local optima that just aren't optimal at all? You know, hallucinations is one example. So we don't want to kill the creativity in connecting people. We want to up it, but have it function in a, in, in a way that's going to be survivable. We want to get to a higher state and, and, and have it be a better state. Uh, so that's one of the biggest questions of our time right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the whole identity of what's human, what's machine, what even is a machine, if it's leveraging off of me, is someone else taking control of my machine parts to try to nudge me into a certain behavior which is not productive for me? Uh, I mean, this, this, these are deep questions. It deals with uh, surveillance capitalism on one hand. We had Shoshana Zuboff come. She talks a lot about us. We had her come to our class and, and, and talk with us. I mean, we have different opinions about specifics, but her concerns are real ones. Um, once we start ceding control to these processes that know us better than we know ourselves, you know, we're open to manipulation at some level, and it's happening already. Uh, on the other hand, is that us? So what, what, is, what do we become? Ideally, we want to have some <laughs> maintenance of what, of what our identity is as we start to merge with uh, other processes, other people, uh, as we become more and more, you want to call it digital. Uh, that could be part of it. So, uh, yeah, it's a moving target. And, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of these things here at the Media Lab. And, you know, we never saw the downsides, really. I mean, we were worried a little bit about snooping and spying and stuff like that, and living in a panopticon. We still are. And, you know, we, 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 you know, talk about things maybe to help thwart that. Um, mass hallucination is one of my big worries now as we start to be more and more virtual. How do we damp that down in the right way that's not going to eliminate creativity? Um, yeah, these, these are huge challenges. And again, in the early days, we never thought this would happen. In science fiction, there are hints of it. But uh, yeah, now we're living it. And what's the next step going to be? I think it's just fascinating. Um, it's just such a great time to, to be alive now and see this all fan out. Even though there's so many problems, so many fears, uh, my colleague Kevin Esfeld, who you may be interviewing or already interviewed, uh, thinks about existential threats because he's in the middle of some of them in the bio world. Uh, it could all go away. I grew up during the Cold War. When I worked at Draper, I was very close to the Cold War. But we survived that one. Uh, I tend to think that we're gonna we're gonna survive the next ones, right? It's gonna be challenging, uh, but there's something about the human spirit that 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 I hope is just gonna keep extending, right? We don't we don't want to we can't go back, we can't step back. We got to go forward. We want to go forward in the right way so we get to a better place. I mean, when, when I was asking that, I was actually thinking much less towards existential threats. I was thinking more of like. The arguments between me and my roommate about the air conditioner and yeah, <laughs> kind okay. of like like I, I can think of uh they always want to have the air conditioner on because mm -hmm. they think it's too warm and they, they want to have the air conditioner on because it makes them comfortable but then i said well it's already cold in here and we need to uh and it's taking too much energy and we're, we're gonna end up kind of burning ourselves in the long term by leaving the air conditioner on so like who decides what is actually best for yeah, you yeah. Is, that that's that's a bit of mark felmar's thesis from 2009. I don't know if you know Mark. He's a kind of MIT legend, East Campus. He's still you know, teaching classes here, and he's, he's affiliated in the group. But uh, uh, he did a smart HVAC system with sensors to maximize comfort. So the sensor would be, you, you train a model based on the sensors uh, as to whether you're comfortable or not. It would adjust the, the HVAC in accordance. But what if you have two people in the same room? Right. And Mark tried to go for the average. And if one person leaves, it will go to you. If the person comes back, mm -hmm. everyone's the thermal capacity of the room. It takes time. Um, you could also think of infinity norms, or you can think of you know, priorities, which gets you into trouble, or your turn today, my turn tomorrow. Uh, I don't know. Ultimately, I think our hand is not going to be on the control very much. The environments, this whole idea of persuasive computing, which gets at this whole idea of manipulation. But for energy and cutting back, we have to be convinced in the benefit of it or the, the system takes control and then tells us in a good way what it's doing, uh, if possible. Now, uh, there's a thermostat in this room. It's, uh, it's a knob. You can't see it. It's behind the shelf over there. 
Uh, we worked a lot with Schneider and the HVAC stuff that we did, and they did the the control on this 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 building. That doesn't do anything. And most uh, Mox actually looked at them, and most rooms is not even connected. So uh, yeah, we think we can adjust our temperature, but we can't. It's doing some optimization. It's not a very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can make it better. So we can. You know, already with nests and so on and so forth, uh, it tries to build models of people. This goes back to work of Michael Moser, actually. At, I think it was the University of Utah way back in, uh, in the 90s. He was incredible systems to learn how to control houses uh, based on, he used neural net at that time, actually, and just training it on, you know, how you adjust the control. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, these things will know personal comfort better, will know where people are, will know what they can get away with, and, yeah, they're going to try to save energy and, and they're going to let us know, ideally, uh, that, you know, sorry, uh, this is better for you. Or one thing we're actually working on now, it's a, we're doing this proposal with uh, some people at OFOA for the Grand Challenge, Climate Grand Challenge. Part of it is looking at clothing that's part of the HVAC that can adapt. So the clothing can become more insulative or more, uh, 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 more permeable. Uh, or you can heat or cool parts of the bodies. as MIT work actually has happened on you know, putting little, little uh, Peltier devices or chillers in different parts of the body to heat or chill. And, you can actually then tolerate a wider range of temperature without using much energy. So uh, having the clothing be part of the HVAC system. So you optimize the whole thing for energy. You heat or cool locally. So you could be, it could be cooling you, uh, maybe heating your roommate a little bit and then keeping the air conditioner at its most optimal place uh, to save energy and, and keep you both in bounds. So yeah, addressing the individual maybe through the clothing. There's work, I, I was on a thesis at the GSD at Harvard where the guy had, uh, you know, local fans and vents and stuff at your desk. And we've done some of the work with mediated atmospheres looking at that too. And we, we may come to some personal vernier on HVAC uh, at your local place. We do it now with lighting for sure. But, uh, you know, how far we can go with that, I don't know. The next step is to get to the clothing. Next step is to, I guess, get into the brain and convince you that it really is warm. But that's scary. <laughs> that may be a little too scary. <laughs> Well, I mean, in terms of kind of scary applications of, of this, I mean, you could also imagine even just a simple HVAC system where, say, there's a privacy concern and then an insurance okay. company gets a hold of maybe you're turning the AC up all the time. Maybe that's indicative of you being sick. And then they say, oh, well, you're sick. I don't want to pay your medical bills. And then they cancel the insurance policy. The uh, solution for that is to go with public health care. I mean, at a certain mm -hmm. point, you know, the solution is obvious. It's just we have to make do a it, big political yeah. step to do it. Um I think a priority is going to be saving energy. we got to be healthy, sure, but we also have to save energy. And at a certain point, that's going to take priority or decarbonize the grid right. so that, you know, you're going to use energy at times when you know, it's not coal or oil or gas that's, that's causing the, right. the, the energy to flow. Um, so, uh, yeah, while we're living in this transition period, we are going to move away from carbon. We have no choice. Um, we got to turn the, turn the level down. The, the, we worked a little bit with the En-ROADS people at Sloan. It's actually great work where they're doing detailed models of what goes into greenhouse gas and climate change down to, you know, choices that people make and, uh, and uh, economic choices. So you look at fusion power, stuff like this, uh, cheap nuclear everywhere. Even if you had it now, it would take so much time to scale up that, uh, you know, barring any kind of a miracle technology, mm -hmm. that uh, it's, it's off – uh, it's not going to be in time. Even renewables, we can bring them in, but it's already getting late to, to massively introduce them. Uh, what well, we have to turn the dial now. We can do that soon. <laughs> it's just that who's willing to do it? I mean, look, I, I have my HVAC taken out at home, as I mentioned earlier, uh, during the heat wave. It was just miserable because we got used to comfortable environment there. But yeah, I mean, at a certain point, we're all going to have to suffer a little bit probably to make it through. Mm. I'm saying that. Uh, will I start to suffer? I guess uh, I've got to, right? We got we to make it through. Um, another technology that I wanted to mention that you uh, have a project going on is called Moments, in that there was a, a 3D camera that yeah. you have going around. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think the basic idea of it is something that everyone's felt that they want to, they're stuck in a moment where they say, man, I like, this is it. Like, I want this to last forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can think of plenty of times in my life where I felt like that. And then the idea is you say, okay, well, let me just pull out my, my selfie stick and then spin it around and that way you get a full kind of 3d image of the sound yeah. and try and complete like sensor information yeah. in there um so i guess for starters could you tell me more about that project and how you feel about that project it has a legacy a bunch of projects they're going to weave into it that one came 
in a way almost independently, came out of the Tibmarsh work. And it was Fred Jang who did it. He's a, a faculty member at, in Shanghai at, uh, I think, the, uh, the Art and Design School, which has a very heavy computation uh, element to it as well. And, uh, you know, Fred was inspired by what we did with all the sensors, and he loved the idea of personal data capture. Of course, he's an artist, so ways of uh, uh, bring it back in, in 3D environments. He was very good at, at, at building them out. Um, but, yeah. It started probably way back, we, we, this is going back to the mid 2000s. We have video cameras all over the Media Lab. Uh, we had these things that Matt Leibowitz built, one of my students called the spinners. And those were little displays that had cameras and sensors and speakers and stuff. And you know, we could uh, connect people across to different spaces through them, including the virtual spaces, uh, and have the data appear in virtual worlds. So it kind of started a lot of our work on what we call cross reality. Um, people were upset that we had cameras everywhere back then, and for good reason. We had to put switches on them. We would talk to people and make sure they could opt out and all of those things. It doesn't matter now. Uh, it should in a way, but <coughs> we had Connects actually just recently put all over the lab. No one sees them as cameras. So the society has moved maybe in a way they, they, they don't know what they are, but there's so many sensors, you don't know how intrusive anything is. Um, but we had these here. I was thinking cool things we could do on them. And you ever see the movie Run, Lola, Run? It's a German movie. It's another great film. <laughs> uh, it's about a drug deal going bad somewhere in Germany. And it can play out different ways depending on what people nearby do, what choices are made. So it's all these alternate futures coming from it. Not science fiction. Just, you know, yes. really, what if this happened? What if this happened? But the way it worked is that it would zoom out the camera around where you know, a certain critical point happened and you'd see what was happening nearby and something would be different that would affect the whole outcome. So I kind of love that idea of freezing a moment where, and that came from asking what's, what does taking a picture mean in the future? So I take a picture now, I take a picture of you, but look, the camera has all this data. It knows I'm here, it knows the time, uh, it can index into weather, all this other stuff. Uh, so it means much more than just an image. Uh, but what if I had access to these other cameras all over that we had all over the lab? Take a picture now. I'm not taking a picture. I'm basically setting a, 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 a reference point in this timeline. I'm taking all the data and bringing it in from this whole ubiquitous sensing infrastructure. And now I can think of ways of bringing it back, like with Run, Lola, Run, where we could expand our view of that moment. What's happening in the next room? What's happening over here? I mean, there's a causal, uh, something in the other room is not going to influence me right away. There's a causal propagation that has to happen getting into a light cone idea maybe. But it's fascinating to freeze all the information and then bring it back to look at in different ways. We never did it. The student went up doing the, the boxy robot that would, and that became famous actually, would, a robot would get lost in the lab and ask people for help and it was cute and then it would interview them. So it was just a, a ploy to get pull data out of people. And then he took video, was interviewing them, we could build a whole collage of a space based on what the robot captured. Uh, and again, the same idea. You're capturing the essence of a space, but he did it, Alex did it at that time with a robot. But I thought at one point, let's use the spinners because take a picture, boom, this point is important. Let's capture everything and then build a whole picture of everything at that space and browse it in different ways. Still hasn't been done, I don't think, and still could be an interesting thing to play with. But it uh, kind of gets to that idea of uh, looking at multi-sensors around a special moment because you capture all the information. Can we start getting access to it? And, and, and exploring in different ways. Not just the picture, not just my 360 camera, not just stuff I own, but the ubiquitous everything. Um, is there any thoughts of uh, trying to expand that into say like the state of the person, maybe like respiration yeah. or EEG? Cause he, did, he did that. He had a, he had a, not EEG, maybe he did have EEG. He had an EKG for sure. So his heart rate was part of it. I think he had his respiration was part of it. So uh, he captured a lot of it. But again, it was all on him. He had some stuff from our Tidmarsh sensors, maybe. So he did probably leverage that in some of his work. Um, and it's a hard thing because at this point, if you want to look at sensors everywhere beyond weather and basic things, they're all pretty balkanized. You're not going to get the MIT security cameras. Uh, for good reason. You talk to Shoshana Zuboff and other people that worry about unbounded surveillance. Uh, you got to be careful about it. You need you, it's got to be a sluggish process because you don't want to have that data right away. Uh, but it's kind of it's a, my whole idea of what if, right? That feeling of presence. 
uh, capture the moment. Let's actually expand it everywhere. A little bit like in Iron Man, I think he did that, right? Where there's some explosion, he could suddenly, with all of his sensing, I don't know what he had, he could start to look at different parts of it at different times in different ways as right. one gestalt. And I think on the verge of being able to do that now because there's so much sensing out there, not just what you carry, but, but what's there. You can start leveraging it in different ways. Yeah, because yeah, I always thought a big part of the moment is also how you feel at that moment and kind oh, of the state much. that your body is. So I, I feel like it's important I, to expand uh, it out. I saw a, uh, I mean, music has explored that too, where you have, you know, various bio monitors you have on performers or people and use that as data to make music around. Uh, I remember seeing a, a Tangerine Dream documentary a few years ago where Edgar Froza, who's again, unfortunately recently passed away too, uh, he was in this suit with a helmet running through the desert. And so obviously he was straining. And then he jumps in this lake that comes up and, and, and then takes his helmet off as in the lake. It turns out he had sensors on his body the whole time, that recording his, his sympathetic response. And he used it in a piece of music, took all that data and used that. That's great. So I did the zero G flight last one. I went to Namway, one of our, student, uh, our alumni that started a company to make these wonderful sensors that uh, you know, can measure joints and flex and IMUs everywhere, all synchronized. I, I wore them during the zero G flight. So I've got you know, my body you know, flailing around. I've got the whole profile of the flight on it. And at some point, I want to make a piece of music around it, inspired by, by Froza. We'll, we'll see. Inspired by Frozen, did yeah. you say? Yeah, Froza, Edgar Froza. Oh, Frozen. <laughs> Not Frozen. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, you don't right. want to let those sensors go. No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, so, I mean, you have a you have a lot of projects going on uh, at Media Lab. Do you have anything in particular that really stands out to you? Or? Well, the stuff that, that Fang Zhang is doing behind you, uh, mm -hmm. he uh, came from Sam. Actually, Sam Ting had me come to CERN to meet him. He uh, was impressed with what Fang Zhang was doing. He thought he'd fit well in my group. So uh, I hooked him up with uh, a friend of ours at CERN who uh, is a very creative group there that, that has looked at our projects, but they're really good technically. And so they, I knew that would give him a feeling for what we are. Uh, and then he uh, came over here. And he's still interested in space, although he's absorbed media lab culture beautifully. And uh, for his master's thesis, he designed a lunar sensor node for deploying on the moon, which is like what we did at Tim Marsh. We built lots of nodes that we deployed on the Earth, but now uh, uh, we can measure parameters that would be relevant to a lunar environment. Um, and uh, we have a few different sensor payloads we played with. He's prototyped it out. Um, and he's even talked to his old well friend Oliver at CERN about radiation detector to put in there. You know, it's great. These connections always pay off. That's the thing. Move around, meet other people, because later you never know when it's, it's going to influence something or let you enable you to do something you never do before. And I think we can, we, we have a crack at deploying this. We're doing a lunar deployment. There's a rover that's going up. LNT is going to have a part of it. Uh, we got a set of payloads we're going to put on. This is looking as a, a main contender for one. We don't know yet, but uh, in a few years, this note could be on the moon. That's awfully exciting. And then, of course, what we're looking at, yeah, having it patched in through virtual reality and stuff like that. Actually, my student, Don Haddad, is working with David Newman's people now and looking at mission ops. Uh, with virtual reality as being part of it. So it's all coming together. And it, that's the thing. A lot of pieces of my life are coming together in such a grand fashion now. So we could bring a sensor node to the moon with a student that came from Sam. Uh, look at that and maybe even VR, stuff like that, when we get the data. Uh, we're now doing that with Davis Group for lunar operations as well. Um, and we have you know CERN guys involved maybe in the radiation part, some of our friends over there. So it's just wonderful to... You have projects that involve these things. And we have lots of other stuff that's exciting, but uh, that's one that's heating up now. But if we get on the moon, it's going to be outstanding. That's that's really interesting work. Um, so a lot of the, the things that you've mentioned kind of border on science fiction. I know, and you've it mentioned it a couple times during this yeah. interview of how big of a science fiction fan you yeah. are. Yeah. Um, so how did that start? Was it kind of like an escapism thing? Was it just general interest? I was, again, you got to remember, I was a kid growing up, at the time of the Cold War, but that was an expanse. It had, you know, it's a fascinating time of history. It, you know, we were coming to grips with a lot during that period, 60s, 70s, special time for music, special time for everything, including, you know, literature. Um, so uh, as a kid, I was kind of nudged toward Tom Swift because my, uh, my dad knew about the Tom Swift novels and, uh, you know, I think he read some of them when he was a kid or you know, his brother was into them. So I, I went to the library and got them, and I love them. Actually, you find them in bookstores. Just love them. There's this kid that 
you know, this teenager who starts his own company and invents all this crazy stuff. And there are always some bad guys somewhere. But in the end, you know, there's some interesting thing he discovers. It's very sexist, too. There's a guy and the woman would give the coffee. It's really, it would never fly now. Uh, so it's one, one of the issues with that era, without a doubt. But the whole idea of, of a kid being a real inventor doing all that it inspired me to build all this stuff when I was a kid and do a lot of what I did. Right? Look for inspirations for my life. Oh, look, I'm Einstein, all these famous physicists, they're always inspirations for all of us. But for me, it was probably Tom Swift. That kind of yeah. got me going. Uh, and that led to uh, going to the library and just pulling out, I just discovered science fiction there. I started reading Lester Del Rey, Andre Norton, uh, Heinlein. I was very big on Heinlein. Have Space Who Will Travel was one of the things. Of course, my dad worked at MIT. always wanted to go to MIT at one level. That that, that, that was in my sights. Uh, but Heinlein's book, Have Space Who Will Travel, is about a kid who wanted to go to MIT, didn't get into MIT, but had this found a spacesuit from some aliens or whatever it was and had these adventures and then came back and went to MIT. Danny Hillis told me, uh, we were talking just a few years ago after we uh, did a zero-G flight together, he told me that's why he went to MIT. That novel, yeah. that's peaceable travel. So you know, we both kind of had that in our life. Um, then I got very big to Ave and Vogue. You know, the, that guy is just such a brilliant writer. I mean, talking about what hyperintelligence could be like in a human, very early version of it, right? The Weapon Shops, uh, The World of Nellie. I just love those books. Um, and then it just kept on going, right? Now I read Stephen Baxter. I read. Uh, uh, Bernard Vinge, stuff like that. Actually, just looking at some old pictures, I have very little time to read anything now. I get to read theses, got to read technical documents. I'm just so busy on projects. But when I travel, I bring a book with me, science fiction book, and I read it in some interesting place. I eat it, read it while I, I eat my lunch or dinner. I love eating alone because I can, I can read science fiction books. Uh, and, you know, I read Neuromancer in Venice, I remember. It was way back uh, when I, one of the trips I went to CERN in uh, 19... 1990 or 89, it was 89. Um, I, I took a, a week in Venice, and one of the books I have with me is Neuromancer. I remember reading it by the canals in this beautiful European, you know, classic uh, Renaissance environment, and it was such a, a contrast. Uh, I told that to William Gibson when he gave a talk a couple of years ago at Harvard, and he just loved that story. You know, it was such a difference. But yeah, I remember reading. Uh, uh, Deepness of the Sky by Vinci in Barcelona, beautiful park. I mean, you, you, I kind of put all these things together. Look at these pictures now of the places I've been. Uh, I remember the science fiction books I read when I was there. So, uh, yeah, I wish I could read more. But, uh, yeah, I got a trip coming to Linz in a couple weeks. My first trip since the pandemic, at least international trip. And I got, I got a few books. Actually, I'm going to be reading Michael Moorcock. So <laughs> that's, again, total fantasy stuff. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, Actually, I, I read a lot of Moorcock. I, I, I'm a huge Hawkwind fan. This band very influenced by Moorcock. Moorcock actually even worked with them. Um, he's one of the main inventors of modern British fantasy since Tolkien. I, after Tolkien, it was, it was Michael Moorcock. Uh, probably Game of Thrones and, and George R.R. R. Martin offer. They owe a huge debt to, to Michael Moorcock. But uh, I, I was in Cambridge working at Microsoft for a month and a half uh, one summer. I just took the time off. They wanted me to work with them. It's a great censor group in, in, in Cambridge, UK. And I brought all my Moorcock books. I hadn't read any Moorcock. I started reading it in Cambridge. It's a perfect place because here you are in England where this is kind of all written. And, you know, a lot of it plays out in that area. And just wonderful to, to read Moorcock. Yeah. But, yeah, for me, uh, it's always been important. Um, I love it. It's uh, certainly inspirational, a uh, source of ideas. Uh, I, I remember I took a, a couple of writing classes when I was at Tufts as an undergrad. And um, the, uh, the second class, the guy was a real literature uh, professor, you could tell. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a great class. Uh, and the students liked the stories I wrote. No one will ever see them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember he talked about science fiction. Science fiction, it's not serious. It's like reading a technical manual. I thought, I said, what's wrong with you? I love reading manuals, too. <laughs> Although that's true. But maybe back then it was a little more true. I think it was wrong. Because uh, it wasn't. There was, you know, good literature then, not, maybe not quite as much, but the ideas were just, let's say, about science, ideas are incredible. You invent this future, you play with it, you look at the role people play in this future. That's where you have the narrative and the story. Uh, but now, yeah, no one would say that now. 
Oh, I, I know. I've have you read all of uh, Olaf Stapleton? Before no, no. Sure. I think yeah. you, you guys actually recommended Stapleton yeah, to me, and yeah. and I should. Which, which novel should I start with? Um, so I read First and Last Men, and I I will say that reading some of his work, although it's interesting, it does feel very much like you're reading a textbook of yeah. things that never happened. So yeah. it's 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 very different. And I was thinking about like how could you make a movie out of a book like this? And some of the old books that that talk about things that never happened though still are great because they offer such another perspective on them. steampunk oh, yeah. is kind of a version of that where you're totally inventing a totally different world in the present based on uh, some totally different path you took in the past so you're admitting up front that this never happened yeah. um but uh, some are great machine stops i think we talked about that last time i got to that through hawkwind of all people because they did a whole album based around oh, what is this book uh it's a book written uh, turn of the last century and uh, it's about people living in a networked world where they live in these little cocoons, basically. I mean, there's a room. It's like a, a capsule hotel in a way. So you can move around. Maybe it's smaller than this office. You're always in a chair. You're always connected to other people. Uh, everything is managed. Even your food is managed. And you're just afraid to be outside. You can't even survive outside anymore. And that was written, you know, uh, more than a century ago. So... Uh, there's something poignant. It's not where we are now, but we can see elements of it that are relevant. Brave New World, another thing that resonates over and over and over again. Uh, so these old books, maybe they haven't happened yet or they haven't happened the way they were suppo supposed to in the book, but there's a lesson there that's still relevant. Yeah, I mean, the, the ideas behind uh, kind of like a, an alien hive mind that comes to Earth and it has this collective intelligence was f originally from Stapleton too. Yeah. So obviously these very important ideas do have some I think point in science. Is hive mind horrifying or is it wonderful this is you can treat it either way in fiction right, right? um yeah socialism in a way is a hive mind and that scared us so th these were written a lot of the time during the cold war or during that period some of them were um but it can be very good so it depends on what you mean by that right what do i gain what do i lose what do i gain right uh it's definitely going to be different yeah I mean, I, I personally have always said that the Borg uh, from Star Trek are actually the good guys trying to bring everyone yeah, into their yeah, collective yeah, a way to look consciousness. At it. And a cult will do that too, right? It's easy, <laughs> it's too easy to true. believe in yourself. But right. the Borg changed in the last Star Trek movies. The Borg became individual and seductive. <laughs> I mean, maybe they, they inviting us in. Actually, the Animatrix stuff is a little bit that way too, where how do people get into a machine? How does it begin? You have to make it attractive to them. And, uh, you know, the machine culture basically did, you know, through uh, advertising, basically. Clifford D. Simak's seminal novel, City, I read that when I was a kid, keeps coming back in my head lately. A lot of projects at the lab, there are bits of that that remind me of it. It's the, the, the thing with Ken Nagaki uh, of uh, little robots that go inside of bigger robots and control them, kind of like Transformers. Uh, Simak had these little ant robots that were calling to a big robot, take it over and have the big robot go and work for the people that made the ant robot. Uh, but also, he had humans leave Earth to go to live in Jupiter because there was a, some sort of a, um, a biological process to adapt people to Jupiter of all places. And his Jupiter, of course, is not going to be like this, but his Jupiter was a, a paradise if you could go out transform, right, where this is your natural environment. And the agents on Earth that wanted people to leave – uh, through advertising. They just found a secret way to get a message to people where this is what we wanted to do, so everyone left. <laughs> so, and that's why we live in a world where the power of advertising, the power of persuasion is so strong. It gets so personalized, so individual. Uh, yeah, it's great for me because I buy every you know month, uh, every four or five months a different effects pedal now and playing with it, and it's kind of fun because Sweetwater Sound has decided what it wants to you know, look at. Uh, Wherever I go, New York Times, or if I look at uh, it, uh, anything, really, uh, I'll see ads that are targeted toward this because it knows that I bought these things. In a way, it's kind of nice, but I'm being manipulated. I'm totally – it's coarse, but I'm, it's there. It's find out what I like, mm -hmm. and it's finding times where it can approach me with it. And it's going to get better at gauging those times. We talk about the future, future learning that way here, too, where, you know, if you want to learn something – Learning in a ubiquitous environment with wearable technology, it's like learning a language. You can learn play tape in your car. Uh, but now your system can gauge your frame of mind, gauge how to present the information to you, uh, you know, practice you in the right way so that you can start to learn all the time. It's like cramming for an exam or I have to give a presentation. Your system can practice you while you're driving to work or while you're being driven to work, whatever it is, uh, different kinds of environments in different ways. But that's also 
a slippery path to manipulation too because you know learning at that level can also be convincing you of something that it wants to convince you of so right now it's by this but it could be uh, something that definitely works against my interest or even worse works against your interest because it knows I interact with you. So it's nudging me this way, which I wouldn't notice, but then in the process, I'm going to nudge you that way. And you start building these psychohistory models that are so abstract that they have this power. And again, you see Cambridge Analytica, you have all of these things. Even the Sandy Penland has been doing work of that sort here at the Media Lab. I mean, he's really been a strong vocal opponent to a lot of these things. He raised a warning already 10, 15 years ago here at the lab. This was coming. But... Uh, yeah, you get into the power of these networks and uh, you start mastering them through manipulation. Uh, again, what are what are we? <laughs> what do we really want? What are we told that we want? I mean, music is all about that to some extent too, right? Um, you know, popular music. It's you know, you're told you want this, but you know, this is really what you want. This is what we're going to give you. And if you want to stop here, you can. But there's no. You have to work to find a path to get to something deeper. I think ultimately that's what we want is that we'll give you the basics, but we're going to give you always a path to go deeper. So do you think that manipulation in and of itself is necessarily a bad thing? Because, I mean, you could think of like a no. parent manipulating no. their kids to eat it's their broccoli. Absolutely, absolutely not. I think we talk about climate. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, manipulating me so that I don't waste energy is probably a good thing, even though uh, it sounds just the manipulation word is the wrong word. People in the field use other words. Uh, influencing is still not a good word. But, uh, yeah, there are applications that are going to be important. And parents, we, we do it all the time, right? Um, and in a way, maybe we're all children to this, <laughs> this <laughs> to high, the high mind. mind. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can look at it a different way. I don't think it has to be entirely bad, though. Uh, yeah, obviously, you guys and Zapians probably are more convinced. Uh, I still don't know. I see bad ways it can play out, but I think there's a lot of benefit to it, right? I mean, there are obviously are bad ways for this to occur. I mean, you oh, can look great. at QAnon. You can look at a lot yeah. of the way the political campaigns are run that are yeah. kind of going towards a single person's interest rather than the, the greater yeah. good's interest. Um, but so I guess on a, a more personal note, would you join the board or would you go into the matrix if you didn't know? Eventually, we may not have much of a choice. <laughs> Depends, I guess right? no one chose to choose. Yeah, right. well, you know, how am I going to – Hiroshi Ishii thinks a lot about – not this, but he thinks about legacy, right? And I'm at an age now where that's relevant. I've got all the papers and, you know, stuff. But here you, we got an interview. So it's going to be somewhere online available to any kind of an agent that wants to absorb it. There's lots of that, me talking – there's all my stuff, my music, all of, you know, the, my pictures are all online. My, my music that I love is at the Internet Archive now. So uh, could I be hauled back? This is the intri intriguing thing, right? What am I leaving right. behind? And could this this system haul me back? You know, as, it could be part of the board. <laughs> I could be in, absorbed. I would certainly putting my stuff out, it will be absorbed into collecting. So that's kind of why I'm doing it in a way, right? It's all out there. Certainly the papers, the publications, academics, collective knowledge, we all do it for that reason. It's not the board. It's the Society of Researchers. Uh, but eventually, right, all of this, including this interview, whatever else, could be absorbed into whatever this high mind becomes. So I'm part of it. In a way, that feels good. And doing it that way, I think, is fine. It could haul my butt out again if it wanted to by emulating me and uh, it has my DNA, so in principle, it really could haul me back. That's scary because then you get into heaven and hell and all this other stuff, eternity, and you know you bring on all that horrible stuff back. But that's that's medieval thinking. Um, you know, thinking about this future, there's something bigger than any one of us, and I think we could be part of it. I think that's great. Already, that's what society is. Society is that, but there could be a whole other level of society that's just incredible and and, and goes so much further. And uh, yeah, I would be a part of that. So am I going to be physically a part of it as a conscious human being? Or is it just going to be my artifacts that are part of it? Maybe. We don't know. It's happening fast. But I don't know. For you, you, you will maybe be able to make that decision. I, <laughs> I might be hauled in you know, with, with my detritus. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've talked a, about a few different books, a few different TV shows and films. Do you have... A preferred media of science fiction. Books. 
I still I love to read. I mean, the films. I remember Marvin Minsky. I remember you always the things Marvin said that that kind of you know like Sam or these MIT has these people and they say things and they kind of rattle around in your your subconscious for a while. And Marvin at one point just mused when I was with him, what if TV was really good? Wouldn't that be awful? Because then we'd do nothing. Uh, you know, because I, I never used to watch TV, and I still don't because I'm always busy doing something. But once in a while I do, so I'll binge watch like The Expanse, which it started off kind of slow, but damn, it felt good. And uh, uh, there are a few other series I've, I've binged watched. The German thing, Dark, it got really complicated <laughs> in the end, but it was kind of intriguing. Um, so, yeah, a great film or uh, yeah, cinema certainly is an art form and even in science fiction we just have some great movies coming out more and more and more because it's a part of the culture so much now it's infused into everything uh, I tend to like paradoxical movies too that have something you have to figure out it's not exactly obvious what's going on but you have to kind of figure it out um, so I, I will I will enjoy them you know, more than I ever did but uh, you know, my time is limited so books, I think you can really engage yourself in some different ways. Of course, for music, it was me as my main media. I, have, I play, I listen to music constantly. So I've always been that way. And uh, now that I have 18,000 albums that shuffle, I'm always surprised by stuff I've dug up uh, or I haven't heard this in ages. This is great to hear this in this light. It's just so wonderful. I do that while I read. So uh, I tend to do both at once. If I'm watching something on a screen, I'm stuck. That's what I'm doing. It's got me completely. But if I listen to music and I'm, I'm reading, I can do both. And in a way, when I hear the piece of music later, I can remember the book I read during that period, which is great. I remember reading a George R. R. Martin's uh, Sand King's short story collection. Actually, first I, I, I had heard, I've never read much Martin, actually, still haven't. But that was, was, was motivating, especially this really weird short story he did about a, a culture, kind of a decadent culture, in a dying planet. So the sun is just dying. It's a red giant. They're living underground. And they're all falling apart. And they have these rituals that are just twisted and counterproductive. And it, it's, it had a flavor to it, though, that was unique. And I was listening to music then from this Australian man called Laughing Hands, all this abstract kind of sound sculpture stuff. It just works so perfectly with that story that now whenever I hear the music, I remember the story. So uh, yeah, th those two media I tend to fuse. And yeah, I, I still love, like all of us, I love to watch a good film. But uh, for me, it's a luxury because I'm, I'm just so busy doing other things. I mean, I, I would always think of the opposite that it takes less time to watch a movie than to read a book. Maybe it does. I'm just a slow reader. It, yeah, it does, but it's a richer experience and you're doing other things while you're reading and that infuses the, the thing. It could be music, it could be you know, being in a restaurant in a beautiful town somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's something beautiful about that mix. I, uh, I, I read a story by Richard Matheson recently that was about this this janitor who went into uh, who was working at a university and he started being able to absorb all of the information as he as he walked by he went to the math department and all of a sudden he knew all of these mathematical theorems and he went to the French department and he learned to speak French um, and it was supposed to be like this amazing superpower that he had gained and he can regurgitate all this information and I realized when I was reading that that we already have that right like we have Google in our phone and now we can access all of that information and this is the story was only written probably like 40 years ago um, and it's, uh, I think it's kind of crazy that in a lot of ways to someone 40 years ago, we pretty much everyone has a superpower in their it's, pocket. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. It's, it's tremendously democratizing. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that all the world's knowledge pretty much is, is available at hands reach and soon will be context leverage. So, uh, yeah, it will start suggesting you should look at this. What about this? It's going to be more of a partnering guiding thing. Um, Libraries are already dealing with it. I still love libraries, but uh, yeah, they're going to be serving all kinds of different functions in the future, not just the repository for books. Um, so yeah, we, we, we've crossed the threshold with what Google has done, with what, uh, it's associated memory basically too. That's the amazing thing about this is that I have half memories of things, like a piece of music I liked. I can remember, or a book I liked, or a movie I liked. I can describe it just as a scene I remember or uh, something about the album, and I'll find it. It's incredible. Already years ago, I found a, a science fiction movie. Well, a, a few of them I found, but there's one of them. Oh, I loved it. I saw it on TV, but only like the last 10 minutes. And it's a time travel movie about a parking meter. Where you, you know, If he puts the money in the parking meter, he doesn't get the ticket, it's not good. Or no, if he does, he doesn't get the ticket, it's, it's, it's good. If he doesn't get the ticket, he gets the ticket. 
you know, something happens at the courthouse because he just challenges it and it just the world falls apart. So that simple thing, money in the parking meter. And I loved it. It was a beautiful movie. I had no idea. It was a time travel movie about someone parking meter. I just searched for it. I found the movie. <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah. It's totally obscure. No one's ever heard of this movie. Yeah. I, I actually was even able to go online and buy it. So I have it and I watched yeah. it and it was good. Um, but uh, yeah, we're at the point now where it's our memories on and it's associated with memory. And that was the whole thing, right? Memory before you had to go to an address or a location or go with an index and do exactly what's that. Now you can go associatively and do a search and and then you find it. So, uh, yeah, we were doing track fitting at CERN that way back in the early days, right? You broadcast parts of the track and things through it, ages would come and then you have a totally different way of, of fitting your tracks. But yeah, now it's, it's life. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, kind of like a reliance on the technology. Like I can't even drive mine back home most of the time. Just because I'm just well, so this is the other thing, and, and talking about science fiction, I mean, one of the, the books I, I enjoyed reading a lot years ago was uh, um, Accelerando, Charles Strauss. It happened at a point in my life where I could start to relate with some of the things that the character was going through, and uh, he's a weird guy. But uh, the thing, there were a bunch of things I remember from that. It, it takes you all the way through the singularity, really, from the, a guy kind of in an environment like the Media Lab, or actually, he even used the word Media Lab in the book, you know, it's like a... This guy was like a self-contained media lab, uh, inventing all this stuff. And uh, he uh, uh, eventually gets pulled through the singularity into this far future where we're not corporeal anymore. So it's just amazing to see this whole extension. I don't know if you read the book. And it's funny. Strauss has is, is, is got a sense of humor. Um, but there was a period where kind of you know, toward the middle, he had uh, Armadillo Rally glasses that were suggestive, that were you – know, you know, working off context. Um, and he relied on them. He'd do everything with his glasses. Someone stole them. And uh, right away, he felt stupid. He felt mentally deficient. They're gone. He was in awe. He couldn't think because his brain had plasticized around the glasses. Now, we're gonna, th this is prescient, prescient in a way. We're going to this world where we have all these aids. We have Google. We have all these other things. Uh, we don't drive our cars the way we did. Soon we won't be driving them at all. Um, but just for a basic cognitive function, I don't want to, at least the way I think now, eventually it may change, but I don't want to have to have it unplugged and then not be able to function. I want to be able to take off those glasses, you know, throw my phone somewhere, whatever else, and still be 100% there. Uh, and I think one of the functions of these devices is going to be to train us to live without them. So always, even though we're going to depend on it, it's, it's not going to get us to a state, hopefully, where we can't function without them. It's going to also somewhere or other coach us so that you know we are competent without them too i mean I, I feel like in a lot of ways we've already gone too far i mean we always talk about like the millennials that have their their cell phones in their hands but yeah. i mean even the people that are saying oh I, I i live my life without my smartphone you throw them in the woods they're not going to be able to like hunt a deer and survive with sticks yeah, i mean i think i think kind of human society right. has has made it's us it. soft in a lot of ways i but mean i don't think that's a bad thing either yeah well the survivalists of course believe that we have to have that ability. I mean, look, I think it's wonderful to be self-sufficient. So being able to uh, get around in, in your environment with maybe some extra extension on it and feel sufficient in it to be able to function is, is an important thing. If we you know, restrict it too much so that we're really you know, in a very narrow part of reality where we live, it's, it's not as good. In reality, you know, we've evolved to a niche, so it happens by default, <laughs> even before talking about cognitive uh, issues. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, you t we talked about skills in physics and knowledge skills and things like that. You know, physical skill, I mean, I wish I was a better swimmer. I could swim, but I, I probably should be a better one. My kids are better swimmers than I am, at least my older daughter is, and that's great. Um, I can run a bit. I'm never going to be a champion runner, but okay, that I did enough there. I wish I could be a better piano player. Um, I'm okay, I can have fun. But there are heights I can see the edge of that I know I could have gotten there. I didn't take that path. In a way, I wish I did. Maybe it doesn't matter. And I'm, it's good that I can do all the things I do because you know, I can't be an expert in all of them. Um, but yeah, you, you wonder about this. You, where's the limit of self-sufficiency, right? And I think it's good to be self-sufficient. I used to work on my house all the time. I do everything. I, wouldn't, I do even a little bit of plumbing. I do some electrical work, I, I do carpentry. I don't have any time for that anymore. I realize these people are better at it than me, so it's better to have 
get an expert work on it. But there's something I liked. Even though I could afford to have a contractor come, I just like to do it myself. My dad was like that. So uh, competence, sufficiency, not relying on a system. There's a certain good feeling about that. Um, but going further, yeah, it, everything's redefined. What is the system? What is me? What is competency? These are all, there are different kinds of competency. These are all in flux. I mean, the way that I've always kind of looked at it is I, I have a finite amount of time to That's kind it. of get done what I want to get done. And which horse am I going to back? Am I going to yeah. back this horse of like learning how to computer program or am I going to learn how to spear hunt in the woods? I, I think there's a finite amount of uh, mastery too, which you can get, right? Because it takes effort to, 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 to get all this stuff. Uh, so you're right. Uh, some people like to spear hunt in the woods. It's probably great if you're into that. If the ethical issues, depending on what you're spear hunting and you know how you, I mean, this is a deeper thing I'm not going to go to. But uh, yeah, I think uh, living in the world we're living in, you're, you have a very good point. We depend on society. And if society disappeared, you know, most of us wouldn't be able to live. Uh, we can try to grow plants like they do in, you know, they did in Detroit when the city collapsed and, you know, the, the urban areas turned into farms again. So some of that happens, but in the process, it's tremendous dislocation. And society as a whole can't step up to that. We can't. But <laughs> also at the same time, I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, there's been so much that we've been able to achieve in yeah. terms of well, I mean, if you look this. at it too, even if I want to, if I want to fix my air conditioner or my car, mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew some things before I talked to the mechanic or talked to some friends, and I go and I, I, I don't figure it out. Now I can Google a, a video that shows me how to take it apart. And now when I'm fixing audio equipment, for example, I've done it recently. Yeah, you know, I can see how to tear it down. I can look at a tear down. I can get in. The information's all there. Not even just the technical manual, but a specific solution to the problem I have. Here's somebody who knows how to do it. That's collective intelligence. It's there for me to grab through this great associated memory that's there via search. So uh, it's increased our capability in many different ways. If I want to survive in the woods, I could probably find out how to do it online and do it. Although you can find all kinds of bad things, which is what uh, Kevin worries about too, potentially, right? Because the technology that's not so hard to master that can cause tremendous harm. Some of it is, you know, explosives, but there are even worse things. And, you know, he thinks a lot about how do you limit knowledge and the ethical issues around it, but also even if you were to do it, how could you let people still be creative and expand, but you know, not give them the things that they're going to be able to get, let them go out and cause tremendous harm. Uh, and that's getting to our original point of Thorazine on the net, right? You want the net to, to be creative, to expand, but you don't want it to get into a self-destructive mode. That's yet another way it can, can go down. Yeah, so uh, you were talking about kind of learning how to build things and take things apart and specifically about audio equipment. So yeah. you mentioned this several times during this interview, your synthesizers. Yeah. Um, and I know that's been kind of a, a long standing project for you starting back when I think you were even an undergrad. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about your synthesizers a little bit? Um, why they're special to you and how it got started? Well, I always loved music ever since I've been a kid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I was a technical kid, right? So growing up in, as a kid that liked to take things apart and build things and work with electronics. In my era, uh, if go back before me, it's probably more ham radios and stuff like that that, that that kids would build or hobbyists would build. In my era, is the era of consumer electronics, technical kids want to build a synthesizer. Not all of them did it, but I was one who carried it through. So as an undergraduate, I, I, I there were articles in magazines and things like that that talked about some of the synthesizer components and how to make them started to be kits around. Uh, so I basically embedded myself on all of this. And I started, that's how I more or less learned electronics, at least at that level, is I started designing modules to do different things. So I love music. I wanted to have one of these things because they were out. They looked amazing. Um, I didn't even know what they, what it was like to work them, right? I, I never tried one. Uh, I just knew I wanted one. So I seen them in performance. So I, uh, I, I, I figured out how to build some of the modules and started doing it. And then I started playing with it. Oh, this is amazing. Look what I can do with this thing. Uh, I can sound like, uh, you know, maybe Emerson Lake and Palmer. You know, I couldn't play like Keith, but at least I could make some synthesizer sounds. It sounded like what I heard in the record. Uh, and then I had sequencers and, you know, sounds like Tangerine Dream. And then I, uh, I, I just would go on and on. So I build new modules, use them in pieces I record. I have some of those recordings actually on the web now. And uh, it kept expanding me. Right. And in the process, I kind of learned how to play some keyboard. But uh, 
you know, I, I filled up a whole cabinet as an undergraduate. And that was it. I built the cabinet in my basement. It was like uh, what three by three feet square, four by four, four feet square. I filled it up with mantras. It took really my junior year, maybe my sophomore year, working pretty flat out except for the work I did at Draper in the summer and then during the term whenever I could. Um, and I, I used it. I'd bring it into the studio at Tufts at the, at the radio station or I'd, I'd do some recording at home. I, I would use it in the time I had. Um, but then when I went to Zurich, I had all these ideas left over. I had time. Um, I had a great lab. So uh, to stay sane, I started building music circuits and that, that ran away. So my second year, especially when I was at ETH, I built uh, probably 80 synthesizer modules. Um, and I'd use them even there. I'd wire them up to a power supply and I'd use them and play around with them. Um, and uh, then I brought it back to the US and built cabinets for them. And it's a huge part of my, of my physical footprint that I have. And there was a period in the 90s, especially, uh, early 2000s, when uh, it was almost embarrassing because we'd gone to digital synthesis. And the old modular synthesizers were, people didn't want them anymore. It's too complicated, hard to keep them going. Uh, look what I can do digitally just with a computer or with a, you know, a digital synth. So uh, they were at a low point and I had this, but I realized I could still have fun with it. You know, that's me, right? The modules are my design, my ideas, they're all in there. Um, but then when I brought it to Ars Electronica, they invited me to bring it to the festival in 2004 because they used to have modular synths in the early days there. Uh, so for their, uh, what was it? It was their 20th anniversary, I think their 15th anniversary. They, uh, I think it was, the tw it was the 25th anniversary. They invited me to bring it there. Um, and uh, I did, and I forced myself to do a different piece with it every day, autonomous patch piece, I didn't tell the people. Um, but I discovered things in it that I didn't realize were there. I mean, I built this thing, I had some fun with it, I'd done quite a bit with it, but at ours, I, I took it to another level. I was doing these pieces that for me were, you know, this is, this is different, I haven't heard anything like this. Look what I'm doing with this thing. Um, so then I discovered that this thing I built has got a lot more depth, and I'm never gonna get rid of it. <laughs> I almost got rid of it again, actually, at the MIT Museum, being in the 2000s, I, I, I got this thing, I have this space, what am I gonna do, it's here at the lab. So uh, MIT Museum invited me to do a residency there with it, and I was gonna say, oh, you guys can take it when I'm done. They refused it, thank heavens they did, because when I did that residency, I, I got even deeper. I was doing things at uh, even another level. So uh, uh, my time to use it is limited, but there's still so much more I can do with it. And now I don't have to make an excuse because modular synths have come back. Uh, Eurorack is a standard that came out of Doppler in Germany and everybody basically is building modules that are compatible with Eurorack now. I think part of it, you talk about physicality and, and, and virtuality. Uh, digitally, it's all in a menu or it's in some graphical uh, framework or you know maybe options or procedural code, whatever it is, right? It's flat on the screen. Uh, you can save it and then come back to it, which is great. In the physical world, it's in front of you. And there's something special about having your hand on the cord, about seeing everything, about having knobs and everything. You can rapidly get into sounds. Uh, things suggest ideas when you see them. It's a, and you're totally immersed. As an engineer, I'm taken because I'm designing a circuit to make music physically by patching. Uh, as a composer musician, I'm listening to it. I'm thinking of what I want to do music with. They're both fused. So when I'm working on the synth, I am gone. Time passes. Uh, and I, I tend to be happy with what I do. So it's, it's a special thing for me. Uh, and I'm still building modules. <laughs> so I've, I, last real piece I did was the piece I did that was for ETH uh, just before quarantine. Uh, I gave some talks over there at, at Davos and at ETH, and you know they, they wanted to feature the synth, so I streamed audio from it. Uh, and I've done a few things since that uh, yeah, have, have pushed it a little bit, but I'm playing a lot more keyboard because it's quarantine at home. I'd like to play, so I'm doing a bit of both now. So I have the synth do its thing, I'll do my thing, and it's just great to be able to kind of play on top of what the synth is doing. Of course, it can be a tighter dialogue, but th I'll be doing a lot more. So, uh, and I'm still building modules. I've got a format filter I've got to finish. It's a, I got as a kid when I was uh, in high school. Uh, the teacher gave me, a physics teacher, gave me a couple of oscillators he had to do some simple wave experiments. He gave it to me over the summer. And I uh, put in control inputs and teach a few things. I made a few recordings with him. Uh, but then he also gave me this kit he had from Bell Labs for a, a vowel synthesizer. Uh, it's from the early 60s. 
germanium transistors, the whole bit. And uh, I built it out. You, it's no circuit board. You built it on a cardboard box. It has the places you put the screws and the terminals on and you put it together. So I built it, and it was some interesting, buzzy, filtery sounds. You know, like you, you can look clearly. It's got three resonant filters, so you can do some interesting vowel sounds with it. Uh, but eventually, it got trashed. I may use some sounds in tapes, but it never survived. It was in a box. I thought about it when I gave a talk on synthesizers recently, and I found online a picture. And then I thought maybe it's still around. I found one on eBay, intact. It was reason wasn't expensive. Bought it, and I'm building a module out of it. So, and I, but I, I, I physically can control the hell out of it. So I've got three uh, LC bandpass filters, but I can completely switch the resonances all over the place. Uh, I can uh, drive into overdrive in different ways, combine the filters in different ways. So it's, it's becoming a monster. I got to build the front panel before I forget what the inter interconnections are. I built the circuit. Uh, that's one of probably 10 modules I'm gonna build. Uh, problem is, you know, I, I'm a professor. I got all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, and yeah, there's there's that, so I got to juggle it. But yeah, music's not over. I'm gonna do more. That synth is is my baby. It's my part of my my essence, right? I, I it came out of me and it made this thing, and I'm still discovering more depth in it. So uh, stay tuned. Um, do you have a preference of performing music or being a part of music over your own work, or is it separate, or do they just come together? What do you mean? So I mean. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I have to go and do my day job so that way I can go home and finally relax and like play music. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that way or do you feel that they're kind of connected? Because it's Oh, they're very connected here because I came here for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came to the Media Lab, I was working actually with Neil Gershavelt and Tom Macover. And Neil's first project that he did at the lab, kind of before he joined, was the uh, the cello bow for Yo-Yo Ma, the track the bow for the performance that Todd was doing. Of course, I got to know Todd through the music connections here in Boston. And I got to know Neil through Todd and his students because Neil was a physicist. We could talk about this other stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, my first projects here were mainly for interactive music. So I, I, I redid the bow. I did a violin bow that was wireless. Then I did the Penn and Teller censor chair that was a musical instrument at first. And, and then I did all the brain offer instruments. So that, that kind of got me here. It was the main part of what the group did probably, a good part of it for maybe the first five, 10 years of what it, what it did. We still do music projects. So they're still embedded in what we do. It may not be every project, but you know, there's music in probably half of them somewhere. So it's part of our culture at the lab, fortunately, and, and this is a place where we can do it and it's accepted and it's even appreciated. Um, in terms of you know my work as a collector with my 18,000 rare prog strange CDs and my weird music. I did radio for years too at Tufts and also here at WMBR. I'm on the board of MBR now. But uh, um, yeah, I I think interesting ways of searching this. Of course, we you know Spotify's music engines came from the Media Lab with Echo Nest, and uh, you know we, we had a big input I think into that. It's come back in some of the projects the group has done. I've actually offered my archive up as source material for anybody who wants to work with it here, because we have it all digitized here at the lab. Um, no one's quite taken me up, although it's led to other ideas. I had a shwari. I wanted to do an, uh, the best DJ in the world because a skilled DJ can do a show that can take you on a voyage, and you don't see it in Pandora and Spotify yet. You know, it's playing some stuff, but it, it's at a low level. Shuffle definitely isn't there. Now, it's, they're smart engines, but they haven't gotten to what a skilled human can do. Um, so can we actually begin to do that? Um, so you know, some of the students would start thinking about it, but then we'll go off in a different direction. So <laughs> we never quite leveraged it. Uh, we'll see. But the archive, it's at the archive now. And uh, it'll be there. There'll be lots of things run on it, I'm sure. Whether I do them or not, I, I don't know. How do you feel about people taking some kind of passion that they have or, or like a hobby like these synthesizers and integrating it into their, their kind of full-time work, kind of turning a passion into a career? I think it's important. Anyway, maybe it's why, again, it's why I'm here. My synthesizer isn't, Direct, it was here in live for years. We even demo it. Students loved it. I never saw it as my day job at the lab because it's even the music stuff we're doing is different. It's got to be digital. Even if we think about, I had a student want to do modules. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's great to do modules, but think of the bigger question: What does patching mean? What's the higher level thing? How can we push that whole idea forward to something new? Uh, so that's how I tend to do it here. It, it, what I do for my hobby with synthesizers 
is kind of a launching point for what a future could be. And that's what I want to do here at the lab. At home, I might just build the synthesizer, use it. But here, I want to think of what is this going to become? What does this mean? Can I take this concept of patching, for example, or this idea of sound generation or a way of learning the behavior of a module and then build it into something else? It could be a different module, but really push it. So this is a place where you have the resources, have the people, and, and really encouraged to think that way. So that's how I do it here. I mean, look, if I stayed a synthesizer hacker, would I be happier? No. It's a hard road. Uh, people are doing decently now, but it took a while. <laughs> if I was building modular synthesizers 15 years ago when I was here, uh, 20 years ago, I would have starved. Uh, no one wanted them. People want them now. This is a boutique market with your rack. People are doing pretty well. Uh, I even suggest ideas to some of the companies, and they'll do even mods for me for if this is a rack module, I want to do something else. It's, it's been great. But uh, um, uh, it wouldn't match what I do. It's a big part of the reason why I do what I do, but it wouldn't necessarily uh, be uh, – if I just did that, if that was what I did, if that was my life, if electronic music is my passion and that's what I want to do, I didn't go to CERN, I didn't work with Sam, I just did this, I don't think my life would be as rich. So, yeah, I, I think uh, you got to follow your passions, but also be rational about which ones you follow, too, <laughs> to some extent. I don't say maybe always have a back door, but think, you know, my, my advice, too, is that think of the choices that are going to lead to more possibilities as well. So, uh, you know, if you go into a, a whole realm of diminishing possibilities, I mean, there may be points in life where you have to, but it's not necessarily the best choice. Take the road that's going to lead to, uh, to to more roads. It's going to lead somewhere else that's going to branch. Media Lab, obviously, was going to lead to more roads for me uh, at that time. Well, it was a, not necessarily a rational choice. Um, but I think that, that, that's important, too. If I just stayed building synthesizers, it would be great. I have so many friends. I know most of the guys that are out in the industry building them now. There's a lot of them. Um, and that's been great for me because when I was a kid, Bob Moog was a legend. Uh, Tom Oberheim was a legend. Uh, Don Buchler was a legend, so on and so forth. They're, they're friends. Now. These, uh, well, we lost a lot of them, unfortunately. Tom's still around. But uh, th they became friends. And that's so special that I was able to, to make that connection. Now, speaking of which, this is a big thing here. I just saw this. <laughs> this is something I did when I was a Draper, just for fun. I was in the days of fractals. It was in the 80s. It's mm -hmm. probably in the 90s. It's about, it, this is a, a theta versus phi plot of a system that's just a bouncing ball and a re reflective cube. Uh, but I'm looking, as I go through the cube, I'm looking at different, uh, different quantities, right? So I can look at the yeah. number of bounces. I can look at how far traveled. I can look at how long it takes before it does so many bounces. And if you plot them versus the theta phi of the initial ray, you get something that's it's got a similar aspect because certain parts of the cube, small deviation, very different path. It's chaotic in nature, so it's fractal. Uh, but these are kind of fun. So, you know, I mean, why did I do this? I don't know. <laughs> but I had to. <laughs> it's the power of an A. I still want to work this on a better graphics system. This is a PC running basic with eight colors. It take forever to make these. Now I could do something awesome. And the code is pretty simple. I still got code to actually do it. Uh, it's, on, it's been on the burner for, for 30, 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone else will do it. But uh, yeah, I thought about doing it and writing a, Leonardo article, a, Leonardo, a short Leonardo article about it. Uh, but yeah, these things, uh, why do we do them? I don't know. Nothing useful about it. But of course, after that, I got to know about bigger ball computing, and then I got to meet Ed Fridkin. <laughs> I think I mentioned that maybe to Ed when I met him. I don't remember. We were talking about the Muse meme, this algorithmic synthesizer. But yeah, there are all these tangents to things, right? Yeah. I mean, it is kind of an interesting metaphor that you have multiple paths leading to multiple paths, yeah, and then it ends up becoming fractal, and you end up kind of yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah, no, I guess you're right. I, my life is a metaphor for this. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, look, it's it's just never wasted. There's so many interesting things you can do in the world. I mean, uh, and every turn there's more possibilities. So that's, yeah. that's the great thing about it. Yeah. Um, so also with music and kind of the rise of interconnectedness and with the internet, I mean, there's been the rise of things like SoundCloud uh, yeah. and, and YouTube and TikTok, people putting music on different forms of social media. Mm -hmm. um, and there's kind of more music available now than there yeah. ever has been. It's good. Um, A lot mm -hmm. of it is. 
It's uh, most people. I mean, a lot of my friends that are my age would say, especially my old friends, some of them would say, uh, you know, the great music happened when in the sixties, seventies, maybe. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it's always great music. There's some eras that may be a little more creative than others, depending on what you want to see. There's always something interesting, always good ideas. The great thing now is that we don't have the tyranny of the darn major labels. When I was a kid, it was hard to get music out uh, unless you had a contract. You have a contract that's going to be pushing you more or less into being mediocre. Now, yeah, Zappa used to say, he's got this great clip that's online where uh, – you know, the, the old guys that really were in the business smoking the cigar were actually great because they would take a risk. They didn't care. They didn't understand it anyway. So they said, well, I'll just take a risk with this crazy guy and see what happens. So some music would get up under the radar. Um, the guys that came after, you know, the suave young guys that used to deliver the coffee, but now they become AR men themselves. Uh, they think they know what the music is and they start, you know, really streamlining the process. That's probably unfair because uh, throughout – the eras of recorded music, there are always independent labels that come up. There are always things that have ways of coming out. But it was never easy. I mean, the major labels really did have kind of a hold over, at least the, the large part of the business. Um, yeah, I, I'm one of the few people that really would seek out independent music and find it. Being at the radio station was a great way to access it. Um, word of mouth with friends. And, and we had great record stores here in Boston at the time that would have uh, independent selections. We could find still things that weren't coming out on a major label that were great. Now, that's gone. Um, music can, can get can get out. You know, look, I have my band camp page. I'm not going to make any money on it. <laughs> I give everything away anyway. But you can just put your stuff out if you want. And you know, the people that are interested in it can like it. And I, I just give all kinds of music all the time. Uh, I used to listen to radio. I, I did radio at these places, but I also listened to WZBC and WMFO, where I, I rebuilt the station eventually, too. And uh, even WTBS, WNVR here at MIT. And, uh, yeah, I would discover things. The old WBCN, that movie, the documentary on BCN is incredible because it describes what it was like when I was growing up when music changed and FM radio became the conduit. And that was the station that – was just an innovative beacon in the very early 70s, late 60s, nothing like it. After that, it became commercial, and, and they lost it. But, uh, um, yeah, there, those were how you'd find out about new music then. Now, you know, social media, emails, you know, I'm on various lists. Uh, the reason why I joined Facebook is for music, because my, my music friends I respected were started groups on, on Facebook for avant-garde, uh, electronics, uh, classic, uh, uh, avant-garde rock, strange jazz. And, you know, I'm, I'm recommended all kinds of things from them all the time. And probably that's where I spend most of my disposable money. I still buy physical media. At this point, it's all going to the Internet Archive. That'll stop at some point soon, at least so I say. But, uh, um, yeah, we can discover music in so many different ways now. And the question is, do we consume? We do consume it in a different way. I mean, the album is kind of dead. It's one thing that Stephen Wilson, one of the you know real icons of newer age, newer day prog, prog music, was saying years ago. I think he's right. Uh, the album is so special. A great album takes you like a, like a great radio show. It takes you on a voyage. You know the, the pieces run into each other, and uh, the whole album is a piece. You don't see that now because uh, people don't have the patience, or you're on shuffle. I, I tend to listen to shuffle now, too. I listen to music two ways. One way is uh, if I'm at my office at this point. I used to listen in the car to a CD, but I, my car doesn't take a CD player. And it's hard to find a CD player in the car. I have one occlusion to my car, but it stopped working when they updated the software. So, uh, yeah, now I shuffle in the car uh, on my, my use Plex to run my archive. I uh, shuffle if I'm sitting around at home usually. But if I'm in my office working on something, I'll listen to the album all the way through. So look at the stuff I got recently, and um, I'll just queue it up and I'll, I'll listen to it. Um, our patience definitely has changed, and my patience for the whole album may be a little limited. This is a great album. It may be a little limited. Shuffle, though, I'm always amazed. What the hell is this? Oh, I haven't heard this in years. You know, what is this thing from? Where did I buy it? I buy, you know, buy things all over the world. So, uh, uh, yeah, there's a whole story about that that comes up every individual piece. But, of course, the way it goes together in Shuffle is just not great. You could be so much better. 
do you think there's a way to kind of increase the way that we parse music? Because, I mean, like we've said, there's so much music out there. Yeah. And I feel like if I just ran my iPod 24-7, I would never be able to actually catch up with all of the new independent music being I won't out. live long enough to listen to every – I could in principle. If, uh, maybe it's two years of music. So, yeah, I guess it's possible. But we also have a memory horizon. Although it's amazing the stuff I remember. I'll hear a tune, geez, I've only heard once or twice, I still remember. But uh, sometimes I'm almost jealous of my CD ripper because uh, you know, it, it's listened to everything. Right. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 I think in a way that's what Shuffle did to me. Before I would buy a CD, I'll listen to it for the most part through. Shuffle broke that. And it's still valuable to get new stuff because it's going to come on. And it's going to amaze me when it comes on. Uh, of course, I can listen to maybe someone's playlist, or there are other ways to do it that are cheaper and more efficient. But this is me. This is stuff I went on, I found, I was interested in. I put it together. I'm not putting together the order, but uh, definitely I'm giving it all the source material. So yeah, I'd love to come up with an optimal algorithm. There are some. I should probably play with some of the, uh, the smart playlists that are out there. But the way you blend them, the way you go from one to the other. As a DJ, we have rules. Some of these could be abstracted uh, and, and, and done a little bit better. I have a few ideas with how to play them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, bring the album back. That's what I told the students. The, uh, we want to bring the album back. So it's not that I want to optimize playlists, blah, blah, blah. Who cares about that? Bring back what we have with the album. But do it in a way it's the best album you ever heard out of the stuff that you give it as source material. It just is smart the way a skilled DJ to put it together. I used to do shows at WMBR where I play music for two hours. People ask, what is this record you're playing? It's 30 things, 40 things. Uh, it just goes together like it's one continuous piece. And a skilled DJ can, can, can do that. Uh, I don't know if an algorithm can do it yet. Eh, there's more than I know that's out there, but I suspect it still hasn't quite gotten to that level. Yeah, so um, what is it about music that you think is so important to you and important to people? Because, I mean, you talk to anyone and they oh. will say how music has spoken to them or, or changed their life. And from a physics perspective, it's just these random tones yeah. that go in, in some kind of harmonic pattern and what is it that you think connects these these strange tones to actual people's behavior oh it's such a deep thing that we don't understand really i mean there are lots of takes on it but it, it's a tough one marvin minsky used to talk a lot about it actually mm -hmm. he, he wrote a couple of seminal papers on this the one in computer music journal is one everybody kind of points back to um i think there are a few things right music is a shortcut to affect so definitely uh, music can tell stories to some extent, but it definitely can play your emotions and, 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 and take them on a, a voyage. How does it do that? You, know, you have people like Michael Klein's look at the actual envelope structure of the tones, uh, but then you look at tonality, right? Different scales feel different. How you play the different scales feels different. And of course, how you phrase it, which is what Klein's is all about, uh, can, can make it uh, feel very different too. And then you're taking the person on an emotional voyage. And a great orchestrator, of course, brings all these timbre tools into play as well. And you look at how people discovered it. Um, you know, in the early days, maybe it was all rhythmic, right? And that can be developed to a very fine art. People go into trances from it with music and dance and everything together. It was social. Probably it's the reason why it's working in our brain is because it was important for societies to bind through music. Because uh, we get it, you know, together in the evening or wherever we did as, as hunter gatherers or foragers, and you know, we'd all play music or beat on things, and we developed it probably that way, and uh, the society would would bond on it, right? If anything, was, I have some articles say people we select for that, right? Because the musicians would be the ones that probably meet more successfully. Kind of see bits of it, you know? I, I don't, not just that. It doesn't work with my kind of music, believe me. Actually, it was I, I saw a great cartoon someone circulated in my circles. It was. Uh, guitar player it was a guy obviously right and he had a, a girl and then the guitar player with some hairdo had like two girls and then they had the keyboard player who had the cat <laughs> <laughs> so i'm kind of with the cat i guess but uh uh yeah there's something fundamental about the way it shortcuts to emotions the story that it tells uh and it eng it's it engages the brain in such a complicated way memory is heavily involved in it too we don't understand it it's, it's a frontier still. Uh, maybe it's something that separates us from machine intelligence or without evolved to appreciate music. Does my, do my rabbits like music? I used to think my cat liked it. I don't know, maybe. They kind of chill out at times. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a hard call. Uh, I kind of think sometimes my rabbit might like something I'm playing, but definitely it gets jarring the rabbit run away. 
Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not having the same experience I have by a long shot. But yeah, it's an interesting question. In neural structures uh, that live in the natural world, music plays a role, especially in ours, because it'll read into language. We have that. It's another avenue for music. You know, the, the speech centers, I think, are probably different from what's engaged completely. Other music engaged so much less. I'm not an authority in that. I've read a couple of books, but uh, we're still trying to figure it out. I mean, in terms of your rabbit running away when you play certain music, that happens to me with plenty of people when I play certain music. Well, that's so. <laughs> I used to kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so here, here was kind of a weird question I wanted to ask. Is What do you think a world would be like without any music? So not without sound, uh, in a way, but it's without almost not, organized not music. Not living. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to describe because music is what gives me color to a lot of my life. And even, you know, difficult times of life, music is what carries me through. Uh, true with all of us. You, you mentioned that yourself and, you know, talking about music. Um, it just gives such color to things. And, uh, yeah, without, of course, you know, you have people that are deaf that live without music. We have actually a deaf sound artist that we work with here at the lab. It's really intriguing. It really thinks about what music would mean to a deaf person, how to recreate it in some way or make another experience that's different but based on what she thinks music is. Um, so, uh, but, yeah, having lived a lot of my life in the presence of music and loving as much as I do, uh, it's hard to imagine my life without it. We all adapt, right? But uh, if I didn't have music, I'd just play it. <laughs> that's the other thing. We just think <laughs> well, Eventually about it. it would come out. But yeah. that's what we used to do. Uh, if you only 100 years ago, you didn't have recorded music like you have now. Yeah. You barely had it. And uh, through the vast majority of human history, people would have to play it. And that was something different. And we see it, we go to a concert, um, but we lost a lot of it, where there's so few people that play it compared to probably, to, well, I guess a lot of people play it, right? But you'd have performances would be more integrated into the culture, I suspect, because that's the only way you could hear music. It had to be played. I mean, I think it's interesting that you describe it in terms of giving your life color, where it's a completely different sensory yeah. input, and you're working yeah, on things that are... It's always a bit synesthetic, but yeah, it... It, it, it adds a whole dimension to life. It's just great. And again, it's the kind of thing, as I mentioned before, I do other things while I have it on. So it's not taking me, it can't take me 100%. I can sit down with my, my, my colleague friend Todd Mack over and play a piece for him. You can see Todd listens as a composer sometimes too. Really, that's all, you know, he'll focus in on it. And I do that from time to time, but I can do other things too. So it, although it's a good question. If I really have to read something that's kind of boring, but I got to get through it because I got to nail it, uh, it can be a bit rough if I'm listening to some really adventurous prog. On the other hand, listening to some New Age or even classical music, or conventional classical, not so much 20th century, uh, then it's easier for me to, to focus. The music will do its thing, and, and I'll do my thing. But music, to me, it's almost like a scent. I can be sitting down somewhere. I'll hear a sound. If there's something really interesting about the music, that's it. Boom. It's, it's in a crowd, a speaker at the other end of the restaurant, wherever it is. What is this? So I'll just lock into it. I'll want to find out. Nowadays, with uh, with Shazam or whatever I'm using, I can, I can, almost always find out what it is, which is incredible. Not not always. Do you think this kind of interest in music and kind of synesthesia is what drove you to doing these multi-sensory input devices for yeah, a lot of your work? Actually, uh, something I've written a little bit about, but it's true. I used to, when I was a kid, teenager. Uh, I used to wire up microphones all over my neighborhood sometimes mm -hmm. with wires. Um, not to spy, just the idea of, of just being in this big presence, right? I'm in this big environment. I'm plugging into it. You know, I'm playing with the scale of where I am. Um, I just love that idea. And, uh, you know, I always still doing music stuff and stuff like that. But just the sound, thinking of sound in a different way was, uh, was a big thing for me as I was growing up as a kid. And, of course, now you have field recordings working into music. Most, some of my students, we did a lot of that with Tidmarsh a little bit and the digital sense. And, and some of the students like Gershon and my group are just pushing that into new places now, too. So the whole idea of you know, audio from all over the world, you have this huge corpus of field recordings, never mind just music. And you start working with that and really inventing new experiences with, with these things. So, uh, yeah, that, that plays into it, too. So, I mean, we've talked about a lot of your different projects and a lot of your history today. Is there any one thing that you feel like was the most important or had the most kind of uh, impact on society out of the things that you've done? I don't know. <laughs> or anything that you felt and out of any of these projects, what you felt was the most I important? I think uh, I can take the refuge that 
a lot of my colleagues do and say that my students are probably the biggest impact <laughs> I have on society because they're going to go on and do all these great things based on the stuff that we did together. So I think that's very true. I mean, uh, people look at my work in the Internet of Things as being very uh, 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 foreshadowing a lot of what's happened. That's true to some extent, maybe. Uh, the, a lot of the sensing modalities that we looked at were ahead of their time in different ways. This is a media lab, right? It's just what we, we tend to do there. So I think that stuff all plays out. But the beauty of it is it's still going. So uh, I think it's uh, the ResM group is going to live through its students and its alums, and they're going to go on and, and, and take this, this these little fires I started and fan it into something much bigger. And people all over the world will. So that's the great thing about it.